This is the third session or the third chapter of the Eastern Region Virtual Short Course put on by Knox County and Hamilton County, but we're happy to have everyone here again today. So I'm happy to first introduce this morning, of course, Dr. Andrea Ludwig. Uh, she's with the University of Tennessee and works as an assistant professor and more importantly, an extension specialist. So she helps Tom and I. Uh, she's in the Department of Biosystems Engineering and Soil Science, received her PhD in Biological Systems Engineering from Virginia Tech, and since 2010, she has worked as a state stormwater management specialist for UT Extension, as well as being co-director of the Tennessee Smart Yards program here for UT. With that, we'll let you take it away, Andrea. Thanks. All right, so well, thank you guys for having me this morning. Thank you, Lee, for that wonderful introduction and Tom for, uh, for hosting me this morning. I'm excited to talk with you guys today about uh, the topic for the next hour, low input landscapes and grounds for water quality protection. So the first thing that uh, you guys might be wondering is, you know, what is an engineer doing talking uh, about landscapes and some of these, these topics? And um, I'd invite you guys to, to think about kind of my perspective and, and where I can hopefully bring some skills to uh, some of the challenges that we uh, might face in the landscape when things become kind of out of whack, if you will. Um, so as an engineer, I think of things, uh, I think of the landscape like a system, whether it's at the scale of our own backyards or at the watershed scale, so at a landscape scale, when we see things that are out of whack, in that system causing challenges to the way we need to uh, utilize the land or we the way we need the land to respond um, you know that's where i kind of start to try to piece together you know what are the issues here and what are some issues that we can um, you know work with the conditions at a site to find a more sustainable solution um, and try to to mitigate those challenges through um, you know working with our site working with the environmental conditions at hand instead of you know, trying to battle them um, continuously. So, you know, from that perspective, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, to be here and, and talk about some of the ways that we are um, finding some innovative solutions to challenges in the landscape when we um, use the land the way that we do for development, for uh, a variety of landscape uh, land uses. So um, as Lee mentioned, I've been working for uh, UT Extension for 10 years, and I'm excited to, to serve as the stormwater management specialist. So of course, my uh, bend on all of this content is going to be in terms of water quality. And you know, I think it's uh, easy for all of us to, to see the importance of clean water and the security that we have in that natural resource. Um, but then it's harder when we talk about uh, kind of at a landscape scale uh, that shared a common resource that we have, that precious resource, and how do we as a community protect that water quality and how, what does that look like on individual, uh, individual properties and what is our individual role in that kind of communal resource. So um, with that, let's kind of dive right into uh, to low input landscapes as one of those solutions to, uh, to working uh, in the landscape, finding more sustainable solutions to the challenges at hand. So um, I don't know about you guys, but uh, you know it's been my experience that um, let's see if I have a little bit of a delay here. I'm sorry. Um, it's been my experience that um, landscaping projects and being outside and sustainable landscaping, you know, is is really trending. It's piquing people's interest. People are are uh, just generally trying to be more in tune with the with the environment around us. You know, recognizing that we have some challenges. You know, right in our own communities, uh, right in our own backyards. And you know, how can we find more sustainable solutions so that we've got these precious natural resources for generations to come? And particularly under pandemic conditions that we've found ourselves in for quite some time now, you know, people are, are spending more time at home, in their landscape, outside, in their yard, and uh, really starting to, to uh, tackle some projects maybe that they have uh, they've put on the back burner for many years. So, you know, this is, to me, uh, a, a welcome sign of... Um, 
kind of our stakeholders, our clientele, you know, really looking at their landscape and how can they improve it and restore some of the functions and maybe bring in some new goals that might pertain to natural resources and sustainability in their landscape. Um, and there's evidence of this, you know, when we look at over the past year, lots of magazines have put out, you know, top trends, top 10 uh, trending things in landscaping and garden design. Um, so here is just one of those, you know, again, number one, gardening period. People are, are more interested in gardening, being outside in their, on their private property and getting out there and being at home more often. And then you can see number two in this survey, gardening sustain sustainably. And, you know, again, that's kind of music to my ears. Um, here's Better Homes and Gardens, or Homes and Gardens, excuse me, um, top 10 garden trends for this coming year, um, enhancing nature. So trying to reflect nature in our landscape, bringing it home so that we can uh, experience nature and all of its benefits. Uh, a lot of the therapy that we're all kind of seeking right now as, as we're finding ourselves in, in new challenges from day to day, you know, enhancing nature at home, number one trend there. And then I always like to uh, highlight um, this survey that the uh, Association of Landscape Architects did, American Society, ASLA of Landscape Architects has done for, for numerous years. And the most recent uh, results I could find on that were in 2018. And for many years in a row, they published their top 10 trends. And for many years in a row, you see um, a lot of water conscious type um, and environmentally conscious type practices really being on this uh, trending list. So, you know, top right there, native plants, native drought tolerant plants, um, low maintenance landscapes, um, and, and kind of down the list there, my uh, favorite practice in the world, rain gardens. And we're going to uh, talk about rain gardens a little bit more in depth uh, later on in this talk. But a lot of these are elements of low input landscapes. So um, again, kind of just some evidence here showing that people are, are really starting to, um, to get into, uh, to become more uh, involved in sustainable landscaping practices at their home and really interested in, in um, making their landscape at home reflect nature a little bit more, reflect their natural surroundings. So again, kind of music to my ears here. And this is exciting because again, kind of at, um, at a scale where we're seeing uh, how we treat the land really impact you know, our clean water security, our, um, our environment around us, how healthy our communities are, you know, this type of interest in sustainable landscaping is, um, is really part of the solution at a landscape scale. So um, I think m many of us can see evidence of kind of landscapes out of whack, uh, you know, very often in our everyday lives, whether it's uh, we've got too much water where it's not supposed to be. So uh, localized flooding, roadways flooding, and that's because of we've got more runoff being generated from our, our developed areas um, to the past year, we've seen more um, algal blooms and toxic algal blooms, you know, dogs uh, becoming sick and a few of them even dying in Tennessee because um, they had Act, uh, they interacted with toxic algae in our waterways. And, uh, you know, that's just a result of, again, that system being out of whack, too many nutrients being, uh, being leached off of the landscape and resulting in this algal bloom uh, downstream. So again, kind of that system, that landscape out of whack, how can we mitigate some of these challenges like um, eutrophication, uh, water quality issues, flooding, how can we start to, to tackle some of these issues that seem to be more prevalent in our landscapes? So a little more evidence here. I have a, a map here that um, I just downloaded from the most recent report put out by the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation. So they are the state agency tasked with looking at you know, what is the state of our water quality in our surface waters, you know, where we get our drinking water, where we uh, utilize water for agriculture to grow our food, fuel, and fiber, um, where we go fishing, where we support um, all the, the, the great natural resources around the state, all sorts of um, designated uses that we use our surface waters for. TDEC looks at, you know, what is, what is the quality of those streams? 
And um, as you can imagine, we've got a couple colors here in the map. Um, and this is kind of, again, looking at a, a state picture here. Um, this is uh, every two, two years they put out this uh, report of the water quality assessment. So this is 2020. And um, as you can imagine, the, the red lines indicate streams that aren't of a quality that will support their designated use, you know, whether that is for drinking water or um, watering cattle for agriculture, for irrigation, whatever that designated use is, you know, these streams are impaired um, and not of a quality that would support whatever that use is. As you can imagine, the blue streams are, are doing okay. So that means they're fully supported. So when we look at the, the state kind of at the scale, we can see just some spatial relationships, if you will, with where we know um, uh, urban populations, dense uh, development is in the state, as well as other land uses like agriculture. So particularly um, in the eastern and central regions, you know, we can see those red streams, the impaired streams, um, really aligning with where we know our population centers are. So uh, urbanization, so suburban development, um, these activities are very prevalent in the landscapes where these streams um, are, are uh, where they lie. And then when we look towards the western region, we can see that we, we know that we have a lot of agriculture there. And so we have a lot of agricultural influence, um, you know, leading to some of the issues that we're seeing in water quality towards uh, the western part of the state. So uh, diving a little bit deeper into this data. So as you can imagine, there's a whole pool of data that you can mine uh, from the, the TDEC website and really dig, dig deep into here. Um, but I'll, I'll do that a bit for you guys since uh, it takes a little bit of time to scroll through some of the Excel spreadsheets. Um, so I, I sorted all of these stream segments and looked at you know, what are the cause of impairment so once a stream becomes uh, impaired and, and on this list in, in red, then uh, TDEC is tasked with finding out, okay, what is wrong with the stream? What are the pollutants of concern? And then where are those pollutants probably coming from? So look, looking at the landscape again. And um, come to find out there are about 4,000 miles of stream across the state that are impaired due to an urban source of pollution. And this pie chart is just showing us, you know, what are some of those pollution uh, pollutants that we see in the streams that are uh, polluted because of, of urbanization and because of our development. And you can see here, uh, leading the way, we've got bacteria and sediment and nutrients. And again, uh, we can recognize that these things come from the landscape uh, that, that we live in and are washed into the streams uh, when it rains. So these are some common non-point source pollution uh, pollutants that we see coming from the landscape. Um, and, and these are the things that we're trying to manage in the landscape really close to the source um, of course bacteria is, is a, a common pollutant coming from perhaps, um, uh, well, all, all sorts of different sources, but uh, with a, me being a recent dog uh, adopter, uh, you know, I, I see what the mass balance is on some of their systems. So, um, you know, in the urban environment, uh, having just um, pet waste, making sure that we're managing pet waste appropriately in our landscapes, sediment, um, a lot of erosion happening because of that increased stormwater runoff. Um, so we see sediment being eroded off the landscape into our waterways. Uh, again, something that we can manage just by slowing down this water, slowing down the energy and trying to find a way to, to mitigate that issue. And then nutrients. Um, of course, we think uh, probably first off uh, fertilizer. So over fertilization, um, that that um, excess nutrient being leached from the landscape and making its way into our waterways. And again, something that we can manage just by cultural practices, making sure that we're um, applying an appropriate level of nutrients, but then also where are we putting it? When are we putting it out? And um, just uh, trying to, to put practices, vegetation basically, having a buffer um, between where we've got uh, intensely managed areas and our waterways. So trying to find spaces for sponges in our landscape to absorb some of these these pollutants that we that we commonly see coming off of our urban landscapes. So just some evidence there to kind of think about again kind of how at the landscape scale um, some of our systems our watersheds are a little bit out of whack and we're seeing you know what is uh, what is leaving the landscape and how can we put in um, some practices to help really soak up those issues that might be um, really challenging our um, security of, of clean water resources. So um, generally, we're going to talk a little bit about what low input landscapes are. Um, I have some examples of, of what that looks like in the landscape. And I'm going to share with you guys some examples of some rain gardens and other uh, kind of green infrastructure projects that we've been working on. So to start with a little definition, you know, what exactly is a low input landscape? 
And it is exactly that. It is a landscape that requires um, minimal external inputs. And we can do this through various strategies of uh, management and maintenance uh, decisions that are used to minimize those external inputs that um, are required of, of a space like this. So again, kind of looking at the system in balance. Um, so if our yard is a, is a system and I, I draw a boundary around it, um, you know, how can we minimize the external inputs we need to put into this landscape? And one of the, the um, kind of shifts that we that we need to make to think about low input landscapes is, you know, we're not talking about um, a, a week or a month, but we're talking about kind of a, a, a long term, um, long time scale when we're talking about this system being in balance. Um, so we're talking about, you know, seasons and years of establishment and uh, trying to find that balance. So um, again, a landscape that's going to require, uh, you know, less irrigation, water consumption, less vertical fertilizer requirements, and less pesticides. And of course, we want this to kind of be a, a naturally uh, resilient um, system, a, a system that's in balance uh, in the space that we're working in. And it all comes down to, uh, you know, making sure that uh, we've got healthy communities here, uh, plant communities. So of course, this is going to be this, this whole system imbalance is going to rely on producers, consumers and decomposers, you know, going back to our, our very basic, uh, you know, earth science classes, right? So producers, of course, being the plants that we that we have in the landscape and then we're selecting the consumers, you know, consuming that, that those primary producers and uh, the materials in the landscape and decomposers, making sure that we've got those cycles really working in our landscape. So we don't have to, uh, to, to require taking things out and putting things back in artificially. And it's more of a, a self-contained, self-resilient uh, res system. So uh, again, we can do that by uh, through, through design, but then a, a lot of our just maintenance and management practices uh, over time, um, picking the right plants for the right place um, will will uh, result in less of these external inputs and over time, you know, really help to protect our, our water quality in the landscape. So um, some just basic elements of what a low in input landscape, uh, some of these elements would be um, exhibited in a low input landscape. So uh, incorporating native plants, of course, uh, we all know the many benefits of native plants, um, utilizing natural repurposed or reused materials on site as much as possible. So again, trying to uh, limit that external input of, of resources, um, promoting natural plant insect interactions. So, you know, thinking about the landscape and how we need those consumers and producers to have uh, to interact with our plants and um, to know that that's a, a natural process happening and, and really kind of making that that shift in approach. Um, uh, supporting ecosystem services, all, all of these things uh, kind of lead to, you know, that landscape just naturally functioning to provide clean water, to provide clean air and provide for our environment around us um, in the long term. And again, taking that long perspective on, on the landscape. And uh, again, these maintenance and maintenance strategies for landscapes are going to, to protect our water quality um, as a community. So again, trying to mitigate some of those common urban stormwater runoff pollutants like nutrients, bacteria, and sediment, um, and, and trying to minimize the occurrence of fish kills of those harmful algal blooms and um, any risk to, to drinking water quality. And really, you know, trying to, to save money in the long run, um, you know, the dirtier the water that we pull out of our drinking water sources, the more expensive it is for us to to treat it. And so in the long run, um, again, trying to make sure our, our environment around us is, is resilient enough to, to keep those clean water resources um, just available to us as that ecosystem service. And as I mentioned, there's nearly 4,000 miles of streams um, impaired due to urban runoff and development across Tennessee. And when you look at that, that's, um, you know, that's, you know, over seven times across our state. <laughs> so from Mountain City to Memphis, uh, seven times, you know, that's the, the, the distance of, of streams in Tennessee that um, are showing impairment due to, to the way that we've uh, developed the land and used it in that way. So some, some challenges to be had here. And you know, some of the answers could be, again, retaining water in the landscape as much as possible, uh, what, 
through designed spaces that are going to provide amenities. So uh, trying to recognize uh, impervious surfaces that are causing runoff, uh, leading to those uh, localized flooding issues and transporting the pollutants. You know, where can we work in practices um, in the landscape that are going to provide that sponge to really soak up the water and also uh, allow us to plant, you know, and, and to uh, have different types of, of plant diversity in our, our landscapes. So a lot of water loving plants, native water loving plants, bringing um, diversity and um, attracting pollinators and songbirds supporting the, the local environment and wildlife, a lot of different benefits. So some practices uh, include, again, rain gardens, rainwater harvesting, riparian buffers, so leaving that vegetated uh, strip next to our waterways, and one of my favorites, pocket wetlands as well. So just some examples that uh, we could be looking for, um, how can we, how can we uh, put these, these elements into our landscape? So when we're working with our clients who are, you know, really on board with sustainable landscaping and want to, to have um, some low input landscapes, um, you know, what this is all well and good, of course, but it really comes down to, okay, do we really know what we're asking for here? Because um, there's a lot of different uh, shifts that we need to make, um, especially making sure that our client uh, has expectations of the space that are aligned with what they're asking for, right? So are we re being realistic with, um, with our desires when we think about uh, sustainable landscaping and low input landscape? So making sure that we recognize that um, when we use native plants, of course, they're going to have different natural forms and habits uh, than our more conventional, traditional landscaping plants. So making sure that our client understands that and um, is not, you know, surprised with how, how different uh, these plants are going to look in the landscape. Um, you know, making sure that our clients understand that, you know, signs of that natural plant-insect interaction um, are actually a good thing making sure that we can identify when we've got an issue and pests that we need to, to manage, but then also acknowledging that, um, you know, when we see insects interacting with plants, we see um, insects, uh, you know, eating plants, decomposing plants, these are a sign of that natural system imbalance. And this is what we're trying to attract. So making sure that our clients understand that, you know, those are signs of the system working as a low impact, uh, low input uh, landscape. Um, one of the strategies might be um, to reduce the need for bringing in mulch from external sources, you know, having native natural ground covers established. Uh, so kind of using green mulch instead of um, external mulch uh, brought in from a, a different source. So um, making sure that our clients, you know, if, if this is kind of one of the practices that they want to use, knowing uh, that, that that's kind of the aesthetic and the management practice, um, what, is, what is that going to entail? Um, and then under, making sure that our clients understand that, that this establishment and success time frame, it is on a longer time frame. Um, you know, we're all just by human nature, very apt to immediate satisfaction. And we want to see the landscape look, you know, the way it's going to look immediately. And, you know, natural landscapes, sustainable landscapes, of course, um, mature over time. Um, and it's, instead of a success period being a growing season or a month, you know, uh, understanding that, um, oh, making sure that our clients understand that that time period is going to be stretched out, and that the landscape is going to change, it's going to mature, there's going to be a lot of different activities that happen in the first year of establishment uh, versus, you know, year five or year four. So knowing that that's kind of the uh, success and um, time frame that we're looking at. Um, and understanding that, you know, low input landscapes uh, are going to take a, maybe perhaps more effort on the front end of this success time frame. So you might think, in the, uh, the client might think in the first year or two, man, this low input landscape is really making me put in a lot of work here in weeding. But when we look at that success time frame um, on a three, four, five year increments, then we can start to see those native plants reseeding, spreading, green mulches taking over. And over time, over that long period of time, it's going to require less inputs in that time frame. So just making sure that the client is, is understanding that as well. And then again, kind of one another aesthetic um, uh, 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 consideration, you know, embracing decaying biomass, um, you know, under, making sure that our clients understand that uh, leaving biomass on a site, leaving sea heads, leaving uh, grasses, you know, this is part of providing for the consumers, the decomposers, the songbirds, the insects, those natural relationships that we're trying to nurture in the landscape in that system and balance, um, you know, 
making sure that the client understands that is part of the process. And, you know, we're not just being lazy, leaving a, a weedy or what is the buzzword, uh, you know, a messy garden, uh, you know, so messy gardens. Um, if this is our client's goal, then, you know, that's part, part of, of the process here. Um, and then, you know, make, make it apparent. Um, this is a sign uh, in a kind of low input landscape uh, here in, in Knoxville, one of our newest parks, Sutry Landing Park, um, that's being managed as a low input, input landscape with a lot of green infrastructure. We've got bioswales and rain gardens here on demonstration. And, you know, the city has put up signs to show people, you know, we're not uh, just leaving this, this site. Um, th this is showcasing kind of of how um, a native sustainable landscaping uh, landscape you know transitions over time and matures and so kind of making the public and making anybody who might see that landscape uh, you know aware of you know it's it's intentional and um, hopefully you know there's there's lots of educational materials out there at least provided by the city that help um, help show people what the, the the benefits of this landscape are so again, um, kind of part of the process, part of, of, of showing people that, that this is intentional and all of the benefits that are gonna come um, from, from some of these management and maintenance strategies. So um, what, is, what does this look like in the landscape? Uh, let's talk about some, some examples here that many of you guys are, are probably already doing to some, some degree. So again, we can accomplish low input landscapes um, on many scales uh, and, and kind of along a spectrum of, you know, some management decisions we'll be making towards that way all the way to, um, I'm gonna do as many sustainable landscaping uh, practices as possible. So we can do that uh, through, again, through just management uh, decisions. Um, how, how we utilize um, a, a common space in a subdivision, um, just understanding that uh, we can uh, use that space, um, find areas for walking, for, um, for the activities that the community needs to use that landscape. But then are there, are there places in that landscape that perhaps don't need to be, be mowed down and can restore um, a native meadow that perhaps would bring some elements of, uh, of nature, of supporting the, the environment, of attracting songbirds, some other elements that the community might be interested in? You know, are, are there spaces that uh, would lend themselves to that? So just management decisions um, in some of those kind of common areas um, around uh, the, the the subdivision, the, the, the homes in a neighborhood. Um, and then we can do this through design and, and you know, structural and passive practices. And that's kind of where this green infrastructure comes in, um, integrating uh, swales and rain gardens into, into a site. So let's talk a little bit about each of these. Oh, um, but generally, you know, all of these, um, all these practices are gonna uh, require a few uh, different elements. So um, the management decisions are going to, to focus on functionality. So is a space providing the function that is required and um, not only for, for people, but can we also bring in some other kind of ecosystem service, natural elements, natural function uh, to, to the equation as well. Um, maintenance activities are going to be in tune with natural cycles. Again, just recognizing those natural cycles in a space and acknowledging them as part of the, the overall mission here. And then it requires, it's going to require, you know, a, a lot of uh, new knowledge with and familiarity with, with working with natives. Um, since, um, since hopefully much of the site is going to be to be covered with native plants and perennials um, or biennials or um, you know, reseeding varieties, uh, recognizing what a native uh, good ground cover uh, that might be volunteering in a space is, you know, just kind of beefing up our, our uh, knowledge and familiarity with identifying native plants, uh, beneficial plants, and then what are some weed plants that we are um, opportunistic non-natives that we might want to, to manage out. So some uh, management decisions, uh, just some examples would be, uh, again, kind of uh, looking at green space in, in a project and perhaps converting some of the mown area, uh, intensive cool season grasses, converting that to maybe a warm season grass, uh, wildflower meadow that, again, um, is not gonna minimize the, the use of a space and so not challenging uh, how the space is currently used, but just um, perhaps bringing in different functions and different benefits into spaces that might not, not need to be um, as intensively managed. 
um, riparian buffers. Um, and so this is creating a maintaining a vegetated buffer along our waterways. And you know, a riparian buffer doesn't need to uh, take away access or or take away the view of the water, but really just um, perhaps creating a designated space where uh, people can interact with water, gain access to the water, view the water. But then that's amid a, a window of, of trees and shrubs along the stream bank. And then those trees and shrubs and uh, native grasses are helping to hold that stream bank in place and resist some of the erosion that that is um, that stream bank experiences. So again, adding functionality to, to a space uh, by, by some of these management decisions. Um, and then disconnecting downspouts, another example. Um, so instead of downspouts being all piped um, into the conventional storm drain system, you know, letting that runoff uh, flow onto a vegetated area that is intentionally um, managed with vegetation that can, uh, that is perhaps water loving um, and can take some um, saturated soil conditions and letting that water flow into the ground and infiltrate as it would naturally um, before uh, we built the buildings. So disconnecting those downspouts, again, finding the places where we can um, have those kind of sponges and uh, potentially increase our plant diversity in the landscape as well. So just kind of looking at that example a little bit further, here's kind of an example of what a downspout garden would look like. So taking that downspout, again, kind of uh, directing it safely away from foundations, of course, doing all of the, the considerations that are needed to make sure we're not gonna cause issues, um, and then planting a native plant community that uh, is gonna provide a little bit more function to the space, again, increase uh, diversity and perhaps attract um, beneficial wildlife, um, insects, pollinators, bees, butterflies, all the, the things that the, the client might want into their space. Utilizing that water instead of just sending it off site quickly. And just another example of kind of a full blown rain garden here. Um, so this is where a homeowner um, was, um, uh, had some challenging issues, a lot of soggy turf. Um, this is in West Knoxville. And so instead of uh, working, instead of uh, challenging that with uh, managed turf, uh, you know, instead of challenging the water issue, embracing it and planting a rain garden. Um, so here you can see that downspout is actually, uh, there's multiple downspouts feeding this rain garden, um, still providing this turf look around the home. Um, and those downspouts actually daylight and kind of pop up in, in the rain garden. And so this is just one of the um, projects that uh, Knox County Stormwater has actually uh, put in the landscape uh, through what is uh, now been retired, but through their uh, environmental stewardship program where they cost shared with homeowners uh, to get these practices um, in the landscape, again, to, to help the overall water balance of the landscape. So to try to mitigate some of the issues that uh, this neighborhood was seeing. And uh, looking a little bit more at, at how this rain garden is functioning. So again, focus on function. Um, so this downspout, the water is entering the rain garden. You can see um, just some general elements of a rain garden would be this depressional area. So it's, an, it's a bowl, it's a low lying area, whether it's, it's um, kind of naturally low lying or it's actually been dug out. So that you've got a rim around the whole site and or the, the whole space that's going to be the rain garden. Um, you, bringing in some uh, soil amendments and mulch as needed through the first uh, few years of establishment, planting those native rain, uh, water tolerant, water loving plants that can tolerate the soil moisture condition kind of going from saturation, but then draining in between each rain event. Um, you can see we perhaps have some, um, some armoring, some stone or something to uh, help prevent erosion at the inlet and as well as the outlet. And then making sure that that uh, outlet is directing overflow water towards um, a, a storm drain system safely. So uh, not directed to uh, the neighbor's house or any place where it might cause issues, but back into the storm drain system where it was probably going to begin with. So now we've created this like sponge that can uh, absorb about 80 to 90% of our annual rainfall if it's sized, uh, sized correctly off of um, the runoff coming off of, of a single home. So uh, the, the key being here though, that we need that functionality, we need that infiltration, that sponginess to happen. And so really the rock stars of rain gardens are these native plants that, that we're selecting and planting and establishing over time. And of course those uh, plants are going to have very uh, deep roots, complex rooting systems. And you can just imagine as 
these plants are maturing, we get to full plant canopy, all of that root structure underneath the soil, um, just working to maintain soil structure and open up pore spaces and keep that spongy soil um, for uh, longevity so that we have infiltration over time and it just enhances uh, the amount of water that this rain garden can process. So uh, kind of moral of the story there is, you know, making sure we put it in a landscape where we can catch the runoff, uh, selecting for a diversity of native plants that are going to, to really help kind of self-sustain the rain garden over time and um, making sure that the, the plant palette is healthy. So, and I have a, at, towards the end of the talk, I'll have a list of some, some really great native species that we've seen um, succeed in rain gardens across the state um, really, really well. Um, so uh, just a little bit more on uh, some green infrastructure practices. And um, if, you if you're working on a site or with a client that has um, rain gardens or bioretention practices or um, some of these other innovative green infrastructure uh, practices that, that deal with stormwater um, runoff, uh, one of the most important things to know is, you know, is this a voluntary practice or is it regulatory? And that's really gonna help scale, uh, uh, lay out how we op, um, care and maintain for the space. So of course, if it's voluntary, um, really uh, the, 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 the ruler of the roost there is the property owner, right? So we just need to make sure that we are meeting the client's expectations. And, you know, this practice, this rain garden uh, was probably retrofit into the space um, afterwards just by an interested homeowner who really uh, liked the idea of a rain garden, liked the uh, idea of diversifying their plant palette and uh, put, in, put in a rain garden or a swale. So this would be, a, you know, a voluntary practice, just making sure that um, the homeowner, the, the client is, is happy. Now, if it's a regulatory practice. This means that, you know, it's part of a, uh, a site stormwater plan and it has performance requirements uh, that are documented somewhere, you know, on file, like at the city or the county. And, you know, it's in included on the, the engineered stamp plan on file to be part of the way that we're managing runoff from that space. Um, so as part of that regulatory um, piece of it, Again, it's expected, it's designed and expected to operate and to handle a certain amount of water. Um, and then there could be a possible operation and maintenance agreement on file, which would really dictate, you know, how, um, what kind of maintenance activities need to occur when, and potentially, you know, how that needs to be reported back to uh, the jurisdiction wherever you're working in. So if you've got, if you're working on a site with a regulatory practice, then um, you might want to double check and make sure um, that, and, and look into an operation and maintenance agreement that might be on file somewhere it's just to make sure that um, that you're hitting all the marks and reporting as needed. Um, and a couple uh, other examples of some practices that you might see on some of your sites that are, are potentially regulatory uh, practices. Stormwater green infrastructure practices generally are, are combined into three different uh, types of practices. So we've got our basins and ponds. Um, excuse me, there we go. Uh, so we've got our ponds, and of course, these are our traditional uh, detention ponds, retention ponds, wet ponds, and wetlands. And generally speaking, um, you know, detention ponds uh, are, are handling a peak runoff volume from a contributing area, and you know that overflow is probably at the bottom of the basin. And it's just kind of acting as a meter to, to slow down that water, uh, retain, uh, slow down the volume of water coming through uh, that's produced by the impervious surfaces, and metering it out. Um, uh, releasing it over time. Retention ponds are going to be um, a little, are going to be designed for additional water quality treatment. So these are ponds that you see kind of like in the picture here, where you've got a, a wet bottom, um, you've got a permanent pool of water uh, standing on the site um, all, all year round generally. And this is going to help uh, mitigate some of those nutrient pollution um, issues that we talked about earlier. And wet ponds and wetlands are kind of a variety or um, a, a or designed in a different way, uh, but basically is a retention pond with some added functionality to it to really enhance those elements of uh, water quality protection, as well as providing amenities, especially with wetlands, providing an amenity, um, perhaps in a park or in a common area of, of a development so that people can, can uh, see wildlife and, and all those added benefits. Um, another kind of category 
rain gardens and bioretention areas. And these are just, again, uh, kind of beds um, where water comes into a practice and the functionality we're looking for here is for infiltration. Um, and generally they're gonna be vegetated using that vegetation to sustain uh, water quality treatment over time. And then finally, swales. Um, you know, these are practices that intercept water and again, kind of provide for that infiltration time to happen. And you'll see a, a whole variety of, of swales um, in, in, in your projects as well. So everything from simple vegetated, you know, not too complex underneath the surface, but um, if, if they have an improved water quality uh, performance requirement, then you might see um, some really complex engineering happening underneath the surface. So, uh, to, to that um, point, I wanted to dive into uh, bioretention practices just a bit to kind of showcase what the variety of different designs would look like, um, you know, while maintaining the same appearance on top. Um, depending upon how the practices are designed and the elements of this, this practice, uh, there could be a lot of different uh, engineered elements underneath the surface, while on the top it looks the same. So uh, just four general types of, of rain gardens or bioretention practices that you might see in, in some projects uh, would be first off your basic kind of native soil rain garden. This is uh, generally what you would see in a voluntarily adopted practice in a backyard, very small scale, generally again, kind of excavating out that bowl or, or capturing water in a low lying area and just amending that soil surface, really relying on ponded surface um, ponded water on the surface to infiltrate into, um, into the soil over time, utilizing native plants. So very simple uh, rain garden right there. And um, taking it one step further, if we are finding ourselves in a, a, a site, if an engineer is working at a site designing fire retention practice and there's really tight soils, then they'll utilize it under drain. And uh, again, kind of on the surface looks very much like our previous example. So rain garden native plants on the surface, but underneath you'll have the amended soil that the water infiltrates into, um, but then there's this under drain at the bottom. And this is where the water is going to discharge from the practice. Um, so you're not necessarily getting all of the benefits of the infiltration due to that tight soil environment, but um, you get the uh, filtration and the water quality protection because that water has been uh, filtered through what could be up to three, two to three to four feet of engineered soil above that under drain. So that soil, that engineered media, that could be, you know, anywhere from 70 to 80 to 85% sand, um, an organic uh, uh, component, as well as um, they're utilizing all sorts of, of cool things these days, biochar to enhance the uh, capacity of that soil to really soak up the pollution from the runoff. So uh, you would have, you know, feet of that engineered media and then the water being able to filter through that um, and then exit through that under drain. Again, uh, looks very similar on top, but understanding that there's that under drain that might uh, require a different type of maintenance. Um, and then another variation of that would be if your work, if the project, if the site is in a um, what would be considered uh, perhaps a hot spot for pollution um, or for whatever reason is in a, a sensitive watershed, um, it might be designed with an internal water storage zone. And this is again to help uh, remediate um, nutrient pollution uh, with this. Uh, under drain being elevated off the bottom, you've got this zone underneath that under drain where the water would exit the practice. You've got this zone that's um, saturated all the time. And so you've got this anaerobic and oxic condition going on. And this is where uh, the denitrification, uh, you'll see your nitrates being uh, treated uh, through, through this type of practice, this type of um, uh, design uh, bioretention practice. So again, very similar on top. It looks like a rain garden, a lot of engineering things happening underneath. Again, something else that might um, inform how, how, how we manage and um, maintain a site. And finally, most kind of engineered um, variation of this would be a fully lined system where uh, for whatever reason, there's a potential threat to groundwater quality and we don't want the polluted water interacting, mixing with that groundwater. And so this practice would be fully lined. So right um, at that, uh, at the native soil, engineered soil um, interface, you would have an impermeable liner. So really like this water flow filters through um, 
the, the engineered media, you get that infiltration, um, a filtration process happening and the water leaves under drain while never mixing with the water that uh, is, is, is underneath or getting into, into the groundwater. So this would be, again, kind of the, the highest engineered uh, type practice, look very similar to a rain garden on top, but a lot of different elements that uh, are underneath that might inform how we, how we uh, maintain the site. So just some variations of, um, of rain gardens of bioretention, going from a very simple uh, surface ponding backyard rain garden all the way to a practice that, uh, again, kind of looks similar, but is a very um, designed um, and art artificial uh, practice to, to protect our quality. Um, all of these have something in common and they all rely on plants to one degree or another. Um, so uh, just as um, we would design uh, a landscape to look at perhaps aesthetics and bloom time of different plants uh, over the course of the year to attract different pollinators or provide different aesthetics and, and bloom times. Um, with these practices, we're also very interested in their soil moisture uh, tolerance and um, where we put these plants uh, spatially in a rain garden practice or in the landscape uh, relative to the ponded zone or the perimeter of our practices, um, you know, different plants are going to be adapted for uh, relatively saturated soils year round versus kind of at the edge of some of these practices where we could have temporary ponding, but then oftentimes it's dried out really, really quickly, especially in those practices where you've got you know, 85% sand in your engineered soil and the water uh, moves through the soil profile really quickly. So um, again, plant selection and, and how we um, nurture the plants uh, to full uh, plant canopy cover is really going to uh, impact how these practices are functioning and, um, and if the clients are happy, basically. <laughs> There we go. Okay, so um, with that, uh, I have one more little section. Hope I'm going to get through here. Um, I wanted to share with you one of our latest demonstration projects, uh, at least uh, in the in the Knoxville area, um, up over at Oak Ridge. Um, we have um, there's a new auditorium at the um, UT Arboretum in Oak Ridge, and this is uh, this is a picture of the site from uh, several years ago, and uh, the rooftop of the auditorium, um, no, no gutters, um, and it just, when it rained, sheet flowed into this uh, riprap channel, and this was just an earthen swale that carried the runoff um, along the site and down um, into a tributary to Scarborough Creek in Oak Ridge. Um, as you can see, a pretty big rooftop, roughly 60 by 60, so a lot of water moving through the site, um, particularly in some of our, our big rain events. And so uh, to grade the site, we were kind of down in uh, subsoil. Uh, we were, it, it was left with not a whole lot of vegetation really uh, taking off the site. And so it presented itself with a, a great opportunity to put in a rain garden, slow down the energy of that water that was starting to erode out. You can see the hill slope down here, starting to pose some problems downhill, downstream for the management of, of the Arboretum. Um, so as well as providing a demonstration area right off of the back porch of of uh, this new facility. And luckily we had a, a local donor who actually uh, donated and supported us uh, purchasing and um, obtaining all of the native plants that were planted in this, in this space. And you can see that we had uh, roughly about uh, 10 to 15% of the contributing area uh, we put into the rain garden footprint. And depending upon um, how uh, porous and the the texture of your soils, the infiltration capacity of your soils. Um, if you've got a relatively sandy um, soil, which uh, in many parts of our state is, is not the case, um, but if you've got high, high infiltration soils, then you can kind of do about 10%. But if you've got some of those clay soils, challenging soils, subsoil particularly here, uh, you wanna go more towards the 15 and maybe even bump that up to 20% of the contributing area. So just to kind of a sizing uh, rule there. And just, a little bit of the process, how we prep the site. Um, like I said, we didn't, uh, since it was excavated relatively uh, recently, we were down in the subsoil. We didn't have um, a whole lot of, of weed seeds, uh, seed, weed seeds to, to, to um, contend with um, right off the bat, but we had a lot of compacted soils that did not have a lot of organic matter. And so we utilized what we had on site. We had a, a tractor with a, a pull behind tiller and we ran the tractor as much as we could over the site to really loosen that subsoil and incorporate an organic leaf litter compost um, 
in organic matter, leaf litter compost into the site, into the whole footprint of our, our project. So we tried to, to get down, we got down at least six or eight uh, uh, inches into the soil, really incorporating that organic matter and, and tilling up the soil since it was so compacted. And then of course, uh, given that it was a UT project, we had we did have a lot of students uh, that came out, came out and helped uh, plant uh, the, the space. Uh, it's planted very densely. So again, we're trying to get to like full plant canopy cover so that over time, um, this is just a, a, a sea of different uh, plants. Um, but we did come in with uh, several inches of uh, double shredded um, hardwood mulch um, in the meantime. But you can see generally we've got uh, three kind of depressions that make up this, this rain garden series. You can see the blue flags kind of indicate where the main water flow was. And we've got kind of a bowl here, got a, a, a rock kind of like check dam right here where the, the grade comes up. We've got another bowl right here and then a third bowl down there. And those check dams are basically just making the rim of, of our rain gardens um, while uh, we utilize, we repurpose some, some rock. That was that was actually left over from a different project on site, and uh, this is just looking at that previous view from the same vantage point. So again, um, tried to plant pretty densely. Uh, these are shrubs, kind of uh, right up here. So um, not as dense right here, but those perennials and water-loving plants, um, very densely planted there. Um, after just uh, that growing season and then into the next growing season, we had an explosion of a lot of things happening uh, and attracting some pollinators already with that tiger uh, swallowtail. Um, you can see this is the juncus, some, some water living plants in the bowl, um, irises, uh, some um, rushes uh, moving into some mints and some other uh, perennials. Um, I think there's probably oh, uh, at least 40 different types of, of perennials on demonstration here. And as you can see, uh, our weed seeds showed up. And so we had a lot of uh, challenges trying to keep the, the crabgrass at bay, but uh, we had um, someone come in and actually do this. Again, no, no, fertilize, uh, no fertilizers and definitely no pesticides or herbicides, herbicides um, used here, all um, just manual weeding. And then we laid down some um, thick uh, paper um, we suppress it on, on this part of the project um, that broke down within uh, the next growing season and allowed the reseeding of our perennials to, to happen as well. And this was uh, just this past summer. Um, one of my favorite uh, plants that we've got uh, on de demonstration here, this is the, uh, I believe it's uh, the wild bergamot Hiawassee purple is the um, variety there. But as you can see, the plant canopy really kind of coming in strong. Again, we planted very densely. So just trying to get uh, trying to not allow the opportunity for uh, those opportunistic weeds to come in. And this is what it looked like just this last fall. Again, one of the things uh, leaving the seed heads and the biomass on site, uh, birds were just having a heyday, as you can imagine, um, with all the, the seeds and forage that were there. Um, Joe pie weed, this Joe pie weed, the only other Joe pie weed I've seen taller than this is on my stream bank down here <laughs> in South Knoxville, but this Joe pie weed has got to be 10, 11 feet tall. Really happy stuff there. Um, and again, kind of another view of our rushes, got horse, um, horse rush and juncus and some irises um, and a lot of, again, kind of leaving the biomass up um, to protect the soil and to, to benefit the local wildlife. And one more picture of um, some of our um, shrubs that we selected there. Uh, we've got coral berry, a nice stand of coral berry, hopefully gonna fill in in this bottom corner. So again, um, providing more functionality um, to, to the space by attracting and supporting. Um, they have a, a really active bluebird and other um, kind of bird, uh, bird watching program there as well. So uh, just general checklist for um, inspections and maintenance on pro projects like that for rain gardens, bioretention. So if you're working on a site that has these projects, um, this is uh, one that I've uh, borrowed from the city of Chattanooga, uh, generally looking to see if there's an accumulation of sediment, um, signs of animal activity that are causing um, challenges to functionality. Um, is there evidence of water remaining in the, the practice after a designated time? And that is usually about three days, 72 hours of, of dry weather. Um, so these practices are supposed to infiltrate that water. And then is there trash or debris in the area? So kind of zooming into each of these um, maintenance um, activities and inspection checklist just real quick. 
Um, if we've got sediment uh, coming into a practice like this, of course, we've spent a lot of time and effort trying to make the soil porous and fluffy. Um, so sediment washing into a practice is just going to clog it up and um, potentially uh, cause the rain garden to not function and, and potentially cause the plants to, to experience some issues. Um, so of course, we want to find out where that sediment is coming from. Um, is it coming from uh, some challenging um, shade areas, upslope, or uh, the upslope of the practice itself, making sure that we're finding the, the source of that sediment, that issue, and addressing it. Um, it could also be coming from the, the pavement areas. Um, our cars and vehicles bring in a lot of debris and sediment. And over time, again, if this is washed into our, our rain garden practices, um, could, could cause uh, clogging at the surface. Um, just making sure that our, um, our engineered elements, like our inlets and outlets, aren't being clogged by debris. Um, so regularly checking those. Um, before and after rain events, uh, just to make sure that um, we're not going to, to have issues there. Of course, water has a lot of power, so it can carry in all sorts of things. Um, and just some uh, general rules with landscaping fabric. Um, again, these practices rely on infiltration, so we don't want to put this landscaping fabric in the, the bed of the rain garden or bioretention practice, because over time, um, it will silt in, it will clog up, and it will become a, a challenge and it won't uh, function as needed. Um, of course, we can use landscaping fabric appropriately uh, as we did at the Arboretum kind of along the hill slope and kind of out of that infiltration area, um, out of the main area where we need the water to, to go into the soil. We can use it kind of along the side slopes as, as, we, as we see fit. Um, and then one more um, kind of trend that, that that has come of note recently, um, uh, especially in the Davidson County area, working with water, uh, Metro Water Services on some of their challenges, the use of river rock. And of course we use river rock, it's a natural element, it can bring a lot of aesthetics and we can put it in places of high flow velocities and that's an appropriate use for it. Um, but we're seeing more and more that these practices are becoming just covered uh, with river rock and some of this like stone armoring. And so I would say, uh, Personally, like this is just kind of a, a little bit um, out of control, especially at this site, uh, depending upon your aesthetic, I guess that you want. Um, but just recognizing that um, that this could potentially uh, start to cause issues. And I was curious if uh, we start to see kind of rock overlaying our whole infiltration area, how is that in, how is that um, wetting process where the, wa the water comes in and the practice is, is inundated and then it dries out every time? How is that heavy substrate on top of our nice fluffy engineered soil? How is that um, potentially impacting the, the porosity of that underlying soil? So we did a little bit of a study with Metro. Um, I had a, a great summer intern who went out to about 52 rain gardens. Uh, there's over a thousand rain garden and bioretention practices across Davidson County now. Um, so we selected about 52 rain gardens and went out and did some uh, quick analysis on and trying to find out, you know, does that rock surface cover affect uh, the bulk density of the soil underneath? And there's Blue, his name's Blue. Um, looking at this bioretention practice here. Uh, again, we kind of did a, a quick assessment of, uh, of not only taking a soil sample, but then also what plants were establishing in these, in these uh, practices pretty well. He brought his soil sample about the top foot of soil uh, media um, to the lab, and we ran some analyses for uh, bulk density as well as organic matter in these 52 sites. And, you know, sure enough, um, we, we separated the sites into uh, mainly rock covered. So if it had 80% of rock covering the, the infiltration area, we put it in the rock category. Organic was if there was a, an organic kind of natural mulch cover. And then um, if it was a little bit of both, we put it into the both. And so you can see, um, you know, on average, our bulk density of the soil in the rain gardens where we had a lot of rock uh, was higher than that of the organic. And so much so, you know, like how, how is this affecting perhaps uh, uh, plant health? Um, and one of the, the thresholds that we were interested in was getting above this like 1.45, 1.5 threshold. Um, and that's really where we'll start to see a soil uh, uh, bulk density that might start to affect vegetative uh, establishment and root penetration. And so you can see the, the rock sites um, in these yellow dots, many of them falling above that threshold, whereas um, the organic mulches um, kind of along a spectrum and more of them being below that threshold. 
And when we looked at kind of age of practices, uh, just my last graph, or I have one more graph. Um, when we looked at the age of practice, we uh, saw increasing bulk densities um, over time with that rut cover. So again, perhaps that rut cover being just really heavy and starting to, um, over time, uh, push that bulk density of the soil um, above that 1.5 threshold of interest. Whereas not, it wasn't as um, prevalent in the, the other two, um, in the organic based mulch practices. And then finally, just a little more evidence here, um, bulk density uh, related to canopy area. Uh, we used a simple plant canopy uh, photo app and we saw you know, above that 1.5 um, bulk density range, some of our, our plant canopy uh, measurements really starting to, to fall off to um, you know, below 50%. So, um, so generally, you know, uh, the, the way that we manage and, and the, the materials that we select um, uh, especially in these water sensitive projects, you know, really could have a result on functionality in the long term. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, we also took um, some um, list of what plants were really surviving in these uh, challenging conditions in rain gardens. And I've got this list of our rain garden all stars posted on our website that will be on my last slide. And so these would be uh, plants that I would recommend uh, we perhaps replace in um, rain gardens where we've seen some, some lost or, or use on the front end. And I threw this list also in a iNaturalist um, collection. So if you would like to share it with your clients for uh, what some of these native rain garden plants look like, this would help them kind of see uh, pictures from across the state of some of these selections. So um, kind of wrapping up, uh, generally low input landscapes um, are, are focusing on function, working with water challenges in the landscape, looking at the, uh, the big picture of sustainability and, and getting that system back into balance, uh, back into balance naturally and requiring less inputs um, and, and supporting ecosystem services uh, over time. So um, a lot of extension publications linked on our, on our website that might be a benefit of for your clientele. And um, finally, I'm, I'm working on, on this uh, web map application where uh, hopefully over time we'll just get more and more rain gardens uh, practices across the state and so that people can go and, and see what these practices could look, look like in their backyard. So hopefully this time next year when I come talk with you all, I'll have this map all populated with examples that you can share with your clients. Thank you guys so much. Um, Thank you, Andrea. Yeah. That's great. I Thank appreciate you. it. I appreciate that. And I appreciate Thank you, you coming today. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. We'll move right on to um, Carol Reese. Well, Carol Reese, if everyone knows Carol, probably. She's uh, University of Tennessee. She works as an extension ornamental horticultural specialist from the Western District, but she covers just about everywhere in Tennessee. Um, she has her bachelor's and master's in horticulture from Mississippi State University. She is a nationally known speaker. She probably doesn't like to hear that, but she is and gardening and nature writer for several newspapers and magazines, which she does like to do. She likes to be a writer. She assists the green industry in the Western part of the state and also teaches master gardener classes. She evaluates plant material at the UT display gardens and at the UT experiment station. So we greet Carol and thank you very much. That was short and sweet. Thank y'all. Yeah, if you get this old, a lot of people do know who you are. You know, it's just sort of a by erosion of uh, ignorance. But yeah, this is one of my favorite topics. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of talk about what's going on in the environment. We're all getting more and more interested and concerned. And our clients um, would also like to hear that, I think, uh, from us about helping them establish a better balance in their landscape. So without further ado, I, I you know, we played around with this title. Lee was a little nervous about... <laughs> Topic, sex in the garden. Um, so I decided this was a little milder, but really we're going to talk about pollination, but it's not nearly as much as interesting if you don't make it kind of just a hair, hair racy. And it's important to uh, landscapers, uh, important to understanding plant selection. So we're going to relate it to what you do. I mean, granted, I do like to talk about it. And then, forgive me for just a minute, but I'm going to sing to you. <clears throat> Birds do it. Beetles do it. Even flowers, shrubs, and trees do it. And I apologize. Uh, but it's true, and we need to think about that. A lot of people seem to sort of miss that fact that flowers are reproductive organs. That's what's going on. So when we talk about pollination, sort of a dry word. I mean, we understand the importance. And I also feel like sometimes its importance to the food industry is, you know, takes a big focus when truth is 
what the heck's making the air we breathe and the, the soil is being anchored. You know, every plant out there um, is pollination is important on all of those. It's funny that, you know, our egocentric self, it's like, what are we going to eat? <laughs> Which we're probably all thinking about right now for lunch, right? Um, and I don't know why they made botany so boring. You know, it is an absolute, here's, you know, our little drawing, fertilization, blah, 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 blah. When it's really about making babies, you know, which is a fascinating subject. Goodness knows uh, how many romance novels are sold every, uh, I don't even want to even talk about videos viewed online by people in their dark bedrooms or anything. It's a fascinating topic. And so why didn't we make it about that? Because that would have really gotten our attention and this would maybe be a, a more exposed, uh, forgive the pun, subject. So really, when we do talk about that, um, you know, we need to understand that flowers are sex organs of the plant. You know, there's a reason that you would bring flowers maybe to your, to your date. Uh, romance, flowers, there's, there's a lot of relationships there that you can think about that when we start thinking about our relationship to the rest of the world, that we're more alike than we are different when we start looking at some of these structures and, and how we make babies. So that's going to make it a little bit, we're going to make it just a hair racy. I try to be discreet, but uh, I'll walk a fine line with you, I'll admit tonight. The only uh, nudity will be um, of garden parts. So I, I am curious, it's always something that I've, you know, seemed to work into every talk. And this talk was born because my friend Jason Reeves said, no matter what we ask you to talk about, somehow you managed to work sex into it. And he was vexed, actually. He's, he's pretty straight laced. And I said, well, why don't we just talk about that? At this point in my life, I'd really rather talk about it than participate. Oh, I'm so... Uh, all right, a little bit of a review, and I promise this will be short and sweet, of our basic botany, right? We have uh, the plants that have both flower parts on one. That's our hermaphroditic plants. We call those perfect. They got male and female parts, the bisexual uh, flowers. Then we have monoecious plants that are going to have male and female flowers on the same plant. And today it's just we got a girl plant, we got a boy plant. And we need to know this uh, and how that relates to our landscape choices. So the perfect plants can pollinate themselves, but that's really not a good idea, right? You want to get some gene. Um, some new genes introduced, you know, get some excitement going on, get some adaptation because that's how new plants adapt to changing environmental uh, conditions, which we're always going under on the earth, on the planet. So we know that pretty much, pretty many, uh, sorry, y'all, let me have a drink of caffeine. I didn't get my second cup in. We know with squash plants, for example, that the male flowers are often the ones that'll start in first. Everybody starts calling, don't they, Tom? Why am I squash plant making babies yet? Well, because the female flowers start a little bit later. And you can tell, because you can look and see the little baby squash, which is really the ovary, hadn't been fertilized yet, once it gets fertilized. And if you look at that and you think about womb, right? That's, that's basically when a woman gets impregnated, makes a belly, and you know that's what we usually eat in these kinds of plants. And if you start looking at flowers closely, you'll recognize that, not just in our vegetable plants, but for example, spice bush flowers, you see the round belly there, right? That's your female uh, plant, and they are dioecious. So you have male spice bush and female spice bush. And then you might decide which one you would rather have. Um, personally, I like the females because the red berries are good for the songbirds, and also because um, you can use them for spices. They're, they're big spice bush festivals in the Midwest. So that's one of the things that I like to celebrate is a lot of the wild plants that we can forage on when we're out in the wild. But <clears throat> when we talk about fruit of the womb, you need to realize that in botanical terms, fruits are anything that bears the seed, right? So an acorn is the fruit of the oak tree. So let's, let's kind of get the word fruit hammered in our brain as fruit can be any of these, a samara, um, a, a bean, those, those are all fruit. <clears throat> and here's an example of, of one of the plants that will have male and female on the same plant. And these are starting to, to bloom right now in the woods. If you like to wander in the woods and the dogs and I do that most every day, you'll find these dangling uh, on the elders, but also on our native uh, hazelnut, our filberts. And they're very common throughout West Tennessee. I run across them in almost every woodland I'm, in any house I've ever lived in West Tennessee. And they are, the male parts are dangling to disperse the pollen in the air and the little tiny red things you'll see back on the stems and you better hunt for them because they're really, really small. I mean, smaller than the tip of the end of your finger. You'll see the little bright, bright red stars and those are the female flowers on our native 
um, and they'll both be on the same plant. Um, the other plants that will have both male and female, you don't have to really worry about them self-pollinating. There are self-pollinating issues with the ones that are monoecious. Um, but these are ones that we use often in our landscape. If you read through them, some of them are and others not so much. And you uh, need to understand uh, if you don't want berries, you need to get a male. If you do want berries, you need to get a female and a male close enough to pollinate it. So these are interesting things for landscape choices and for success in your landscapes. If you want the deciduous holly to have the red berries, you better have a guy around. You better take home one if you don't know that there's supposed to be one there. Where others, you want to avoid it, right? Geeko females have very stinky fruit. Uh, you may not want the big Osage orange or but one I call Bodoc on your lawn. Um, I encourage people to leave it out in their pastures. It's actually a good food, not just for our cattle and horses. We're not poisonous. That's a myth. That's better. But also white-tailed deer love it. Squirrels love it. A lot of people you can find, go online, Google white-tailed deer eating Osage orange apples. So it has a great history in our country, and I don't have time to go into all that today, though. I'd love to talk about, um, you know, I love to call them plants that people love to hate. And when I tell their whole history, maybe they can learn to love them. So it's important to know uh, for your landscape choices here. And spice bush, I mentioned already, though male or female choices would be good for our cutest caterpillar, and that is the spice bush caterpillar, which will come there, lovely butterfly. Other things get really, really weird though. Those are kind of, you know, simplistic breakdowns, but fig is a very interesting plant. And, you know, I had to confess, I didn't really understand the sex life of figs until a few years ago, somebody asked me, what does the fig flower look like? And I thought, you know, I don't know what the fig flower looks like. And I went and Googled it, I found out we're eating the flower. So the, the, this is actually an, a, a flower that has inverted. All the flowers are inside, that's the pink are all the little flowers and the little wasp has to actually climb in there to fertilize them. Now, this is gonna be a little bit of a weird story, but that's what this talk is about because I think it's intriguing. If you know these details and you kind of tell these fun stories to your clients, um, they'll be very impressed and maybe think you're worth a little bit more money too than just the, the mow and blow guys. But the little wasp will climb in there. And that's called an osteole. And you know, if you wanna win a Scrabble game, or know the million dollar answer, there you go. You can send me some money for that. And this guy, I'm gonna give you the whole cycle here of what happens when the little wasp climbs in because it's very cool. She will climb in there and lay eggs. She's already been fertilized and she lays eggs on some of the flowers inside and she's pollinating some of the other flowers as she does that. Then these, uh, these pollinated, I mean, the ones that she lays eggs in will form little larvae and they're inside little galls. Then the male wasp will come out of these galls, and this is kind of weird. They run around and go ahead and pollinate the female wasp, you know, there's a better word for that, <clears throat> um, before they're even hatched out. Goodness, I'm not liking them young. That's pretty weird. Then the male flowers will burrow out holes for them to escape the females, and then they die in the, in the fig. So the females come out and they're crawling around trying to find their hole to escape. And meanwhile, they're gathering up pollen. Meanwhile, the male flowers have bloomed inside that fig. And so they're getting pollen on them. Then they find their way out and then they fly to another fig and they start the whole process over again. So are you eating little wasps when you eat figs? Um, yeah, nobody really worries about it. I mean, honestly, we don't have the right wasp here to get many pollinators. A lot of figs now are bred to produce what we call parthenocarpically without fertilization. But the little crunchy pieces in there <laughs> are the seeds a lot of times, especially when you're eating dried pigs, which means, yeah, you're eating little, but we eat a lot of bugs actually in processed food. So don't worry about it. it's good protein, et cetera, et cetera. But Google it up, it's pretty cool. All right, let's go back to pollination, and uh, you know, which I'm thrilled. I, I love that it's a big topic. I'm glad people are butterfly gardening, even though I resent the fact that butterflies are the cheerleaders, right? They're the pretty insects. So I never got to be on the homecoming court. So I do resent it a little bit, but the truth is it's really good for all the other insects and then they can be the cheerleaders. I'm cool with that. Uh -oh, hit the wrong button y'all, excuse me. Next, and the honeybees got the big poster. You know, these are poster children for pollinating, uh, pollination and that's good. Again, they get lots of press and if we're doing that, we're helping out all the other insects. Although I like to mention that honeybees, remember, are not native insects. They are introduced European insects 
Um, but as we garden for them, we are also helping out the native insects. And I'm, I'm not a native purist by any means. I think any planting that we should have in our landscape should have a diverse array of native and non-native that flower and fruit at different times of the year and you'll get good predator prey relationships, good habitat, and you will have that, achieve that goal of pollinating for wildlife and providing for our pollinators. I'm, I'm a still fumble tongue, y'all. Let me do another sip. All right, so in the human realm, let's look at just a minute our strategies for making babies, right? Now I won't have to do that again. This is pretty, you know, nice meet and greet going on here. Sometimes it gets a little wilder. I don't know if I encourage that, but this is how we get together. We're starting to think about how do male and females get together. And the ultimate goal, even though in at this age, probably not, is to make babies. It's our it's in our DNA. <clears throat> Let's go back to this picture and start talking about how flowers uh, play a role in that. But not always. I mean, this is actually this is meant to say, hey, baby, come over and pollinate me, right? And that's what big showy flowers do. But let's first talk about when pollinated because we're discussing strategies that plants will use. So grasslands are often full of the wind pollinated plants because the pollen, their, their strategy is to make lots and lots of tiny, tiny pollen grains and they blow out when they find a female flower. So it's basically like a shotgun approach, you know, hoping that a pollen grain will find a female flower. And these are useful in places like grasslands, but might not be so useful in other settings. Now look at the structure of a flower that is wind pollinated. It does not have the big showy petals, right? Because the big showy petals um, are not needed in this strategy. In fact, they would impede. Because imagine here's a little pollen grain, here's a little female flower hoping, hoping, hoping somebody lands on me and there's a big showy petal that says, huh, poo, deflecting. We don't want that to happen. So that's why grass flowers are usually without these showy petals, even though they can provide a lot of the things that the insects like. And that's not to mean that grass flowers can't be very attractive. This is our purple muley, Muhlenbergia capillaris, which we, a lot of us do use in our landscapes now. Great fall blooming grass, fabulous plant and native. Um, our junipers right now, I was riding down the road yesterday, coming back from North Mississippi, delivering a, a rescued puppy to a friend actually. And, um, the juniper males are really showing their stuff. If you ride down the road right now, you can tell the girls from the boys, even on 75 miles an hour, because the males are very, very yellow. They're really loaded up. They're about to release their pollen and fertilize those females. So that's another wind pollinated plant. How would that affect your landscape choices? Some people are very allergic to this pollen. And some people might want the females too, uh, because of the birds love the little blue cones really, we call them berries, on the junipers. So, and again, if you want those, you need to have both around. So that may affect where you cite them, although really you're probably not gonna get away from juniper anywhere in the state of Tennessee. <clears throat> Just to know that is kind of fun. You can glance at a tree, that's a boy tree. I don't have to lift the branches and look at the crotch. So other wind pollinated plants, you know, a lot of our conifers, our grasses, uh, ragweed, that's the reason we have so many ragweed allergies and poor old goldenrod that got blamed because look at all the pollen dust there. Any ragweed plant, when it's starting to bloom, bump it, you'll see it just billow out. But we don't see that, we see the goldenrod. That's why it's been blamed all these many years. We all need to speak up for it. It's a fantastic plant for our pollinators and honey beekeepers know that. They know that the bees can really load up there late in the summer on our many species of goldenrod. That strategy is not going to work in wet, humid climates because that pollen grain is going to land on a wet leaf surface and it's not going to go anywhere. So they had to resort to other strategies and that was big showy flowers. And big showy flowers will ferry then the, the pollen from the uh, anther, the male parts, to the sticky stigma of the female parts. And so our, this pollen is often heavy and sticky and it has to be carried by insects. So uh, goldenrod pollen doesn't blow in the wind. It has to be ferried around by insects. You're not gonna get any in your nose unless you snort your goldenrod flowers. All right, so let's get back to um, how we're gonna try to avoid self-pollination if we've got these flowers that are perfect. We got both parts there, right? But we don't necessarily want that plant to self-pollinate or it doesn't want to, I'm speaking, anthropomorphically. Ooh, I rolled that word out without enough caffeine. Um, 
because we want to get the gene pool spread around. We don't want this inbreeding thing going on. Um, some of them go to extremes. Some of them will do both. This is really cool. The violet, a lot of people wonder why it's so hard. Those of you who like to get rid of violets, um, I encourage them. They're a great host plant for some, some of our, our butterflies and they're edible, another good wild foraging plant. But they will do both. They're gonna cover all bases. They have the flowers to exchange pollen and get some new genes and they will have uh, seeds from that pollination. But they also make an underground flower that does not need pollination. So the cleistogamous, think about a cloister, right? The nuns are staying in there and they are not getting pollinated. <laughs> and then the chasmogamous are spreading it around, getting a, a good exchange of genes. So they're gonna make both. That's one reason you always find um, the violets can be so vigorous and come back up and come back up and come back up. Really cool. Whereas we're going to our showy flowers now and we're gonna look at how this flower, we don't want it, it doesn't want to pollinate itself. We're gonna just go ahead and go with those terms and why that is, um, is discouraged by simply the structure of the flower. Those little white things you see are the female parts. That's your sticky stigma. So an incoming insect will hit those first and has hopefully already visited another flower. And then he goes on down to the good stuff, right? Way down there in the base of that, of that structure. Meanwhile, he's brushed through all those male parts, the little bristling yellow parts. He's gotten some more pollen on him. So when he departs or she departs, mostly females do this, um, she will carry that to the other flowers, carry and disperse that pollen. And you can see this in a lot of different plants. In lilies, it's very obvious. The sticky stigma juts out far beyond and then the male parts are, are seated behind. Now, another thing that might happen, because of course, sometimes the pollen grains are gonna land on that sticky stigma that belong to the same flower. And remember when that happens, that, that pollen grain has to germinate and swim, again, kind of similar to uh, humans, to the egg to fertilize that egg or those seeds, those ovules. So this, um, another way of avoiding that is this flower has the potential to recognize its own pollen and kill it before it gets to the egg, it will actually create a chemical that uh, kills that, that, uh, that burrowing pollen before it can actually get, you can see some here going on. We got some that tried to get there, some made it, some didn't. So the flower decided, hey, you're, you're good pollen from another sources and you're bad pollen from me. I don't want you. So it killed them off. Isn't that cool? Now, other thing, other plants avoid it by timing of the flowers and, and anybody who has had this question needs to know this answer. Why well, won't my pecan tree make any pecans? <clears throat> sitting there all by itself, good looking healthy tree, because it's sitting there all by itself, because they have ones that have the male flowers first and then later the female flowers come on, so it won't self pollinate. Others do the reverse. They're gonna have female flowers come first and then the male flowers will follow. So what you need is one from each group and places that sell are good sources for pecan trees, and this probably isn't gonna be your local tractor supply store, uh, they, they will tell you which you need, what are good pollinators for which pecans. And also be sure you seek out disease resistant and phylloxera resistant. Don't plant the wrong pecan tree for your homeowner, okay? I have lists available, I can help you out, I can link you up. You may have to do a little bit special effort to find them, but again, that's what makes you the more worthy uh, person for the job. So, and look how different they are. The little female flowers just look like little baby pecans, don't they? And then the male flowers, they are made for hanging and blowing in the wind. And we who have parked under pecan trees or oak trees know these things will be on our windshield, right? Once they've done their thing. Other flowers have really, really interesting, and this is not a landscape flower, but still it may spring up somewhere in your wet spots. And Andrea probably knows and loves this flower because it is a fantastic um, native annual for our wet areas and a huge, huge plant for our hummingbirds. It is um, absolutely specifically designed for hummingbird pollination. And the, the hummingbird has to stick his whole head in that little flower to reach his tongue all the way around the back of that curve to get to the good stuff. And when he does, he has to really mash his head into that little cap. And by the way, the seed capsule that's dangling right below, I'm gonna show you that in miniature in just a minute when this flower becomes female. And if you've ever tried to gather um, impatient seed to get it started in a wet area, they will explode and blow little seeds everywhere. I finally managed to do that at my place by going down to the bottoms where I had a big colony of jewelweed. This is the name of this plant. It's an impatient, impatience capensis. 
but it's common name is jewelweed. I went down there with a big garbage bag and threw it over the entire plant and pulled it tight at the bottom and then carried that garbage bag home and put it out where I wanted to get them started. Now I got galore. So warning, warning, they recede by the thousands, but boy, are my hummingbirds happy. It's pretty cool out there. In fact, it's funny where my praying mantises often will set up to catch other insects that come in. So there he is, he's got a mash's head in there. And um, the first time I really started examining this, I learned about this, this plant. I was looking at him down the bottoms where I lived over in Luray Bottoms. And I saw those are little male parts, right? I mean, that, that's like it's supposed to. And then the, you see all the little pollen structures there that are about to release pollen. So this is close up and that's my dirty hand. And that one, look, it's different. And I thought that's weird. Um, usually, not always, when you have two you know, male and female flowers on the same plant, they look drastically different. So why are these looking the same, but this is male and that's female. But it turns out what this flower does is it starts out life as a male. Meanwhile, these are the female parts that's going to become that little seed capsule are developing behind the male parts. And eventually they push the male parts off and the flower is a female. So it operates as a male the first few days of its life and then it becomes a female. It's a transgender flower. A cardinal flower does this. There's, there's actually a good number of these in our landscape, but it's a really cool thing to know about these plants that switch gender during the lifetime of the bloom. Yeah, I love my hummingbirds. I've got tons of feeders out and I can't wait to see them again come April. Uh, pawpaw is another interesting one to know. A lot of people will have pawpaws and they say, I've never seen any fruit. I said, well, they have to have a cross pollination, uh, another plant to cross pollinate. Well, it's a big colony of them, but that's all one pawpaw because they will be connected by an underground colony of roots. So they cannot self pollinate. You need to plant a separate seed grown individual near that colony because their pollinators don't fly far. Their pollinators are not bees, which will cover great distances. Their pollinators are flies and beetles, and they are attracted to odd scents. Usually flowers this color smell like carrion or rotting meat to attract those pollinators. Uh, I don't think the pawpaw to me smells like that. It's got a yeasty smell, but it does attract um, these, these pollinators. And you need, so you need two separate seed grown individuals pretty close by, or you're not gonna get the largest fruit on the North American continent with all kinds of cool history about it. And they're really quite good. They're a tropical tree that decided to survive the cold weather here and become a North American. Every other plant in that family just about is tropical and provides fruit for tropical regions. That does taste very tropical. So it's called poor man's banana. <clears throat> it's also the host plant for our state butterfly, you know. The uh, Tennessee um, state butterfly is the zebra swallowtail. Little small fast butterfly, pretty difficult to photograph, but every now and then you, you do get lucky. And pawpaws are beautiful in our landscape. They have great fall color. They have a tropical look to them. They will make a colony unless you try to keep them from doing that. So you may want to place them accordingly or be religious about pruning up the new ones that come up if you don't want them coming, coming up as a big colony. And there, um, there is our, oh, spice bush. We're going in spice bush. Spice bush butterflies always look real, real um, leggy. It's one reason I can tell them usually from the other that uh, butterflies that resemble them. And pipe vine, I'm sorry, y'all, that was pipe vine. Again, not enough coffee. We grow this pipe vine uh, here at the station because pipe vine in the wild, I have actually never seen it in the wild. It's actually not common, at least not in West Tennessee. But this is a pipe vine plant from South America that grows easily right out in our parking lot. And every year we have huge populations of these caterpillars and get to watch the uh, pipe vine swallowtail caterpillars, cool little flowers, and this flower, Boy, this is a cool pollination story. Look at that. That's the reason it's called pipe vine. It's supposed to look like a Dutchman's pipe. Well, if you cut one in half and look at it like this, uh, this is one of those that's pollinated by flies. It doesn't have an appreciable odor that I can tell, but they find it attractive. They're gonna crawl in there and you see all those little hairs in the throat that are aimed down. Once it gets going that direction, it cannot back up. It is forced into that chamber where it will pollinate that flower. Now, once that flower is pollinated, it recognizes the fact that it's pollinated. And at that point, it will droop and relax and those turgid hairs will relax and it allows that fly to escape. So the fly must not have found it that bad an experience because he'll go to another pipe vine flower and do the same thing. 
So that, that's a really fun story. And there's our little caterpillars. Now, this was another one and I, I, I grant you, this is a weed um, if it's not where you want it to be because it does spread like suckers underground. It can be really hard to get rid of. So give it a good little wild area because this is a cool pollination story and a great host plant. It is pollinated by our large bees, bumblebees and such. And what they do is we're gonna take a closer look at this structure. And by the way, whenever you see a flower with an odd structure, a lot of times if you go research it, you'll find it's got a really interesting way of making babies. So you see him there, he's, he's walking around the base of that. He's looking for the good stuff that are right at that base. And we're gonna look, but see those uh, little paddle shaped things that are aimed down? If you look at them, you can see that's where the pollen is born. Those are the little yellow things. And he's walking around that structure trying to find the goodies at the base and it's stroking him on the back, giving him that pollen on the back. And if you look at the picture up on the right, you can see that round womb, right? That's our, that's our female part and it wants to get the pollen from those male parts. Now over here on the left, the male parts are sticking up in the air. This is what happens in the morning. And the bees that are visiting are gonna be hopefully already visited another plant. But later in the day, the pollen, the pollen bearing structures, the male anthers begin to bend down, 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 down. And eventually they're down as low where the bees back can reach them too. So this actually functions as a male early in the day and a female part of the day. It's called flexistyle. So it's got all the parts it needs, but it's moving them around to get pollinated when it feels like it's got the best opportunity to get new pollen introduction. And I just think that is awesome. Oh, look at them. They're so cool. The flowers are so cool. The fruit's so good. We ate them green when we were little. We didn't know that we should wait till they got nice and wrinkled and soft. They smell like Hawaiian punch and they taste like Hawaiian punch. So I love having these on my property. Uh, simmer a little bit of that in just some water and you can make delicious jelly, very strong or add flavor to drinks. It's, it's a really easy wild plant forage. And there's our caterpillar. That is our Gulf Ritillary host. This is our native passion flower. I hope I said that at some point. I probably didn't. Uh, Passiflora cerula. Or is it incarnata? I always get those mixed up. Incarnata cerula. Somebody type it in the chat. I have a, a mental. I have dyslexia with some plants. With this and with uh, hornbeam and hot hornbeam. I just have dyslexia. I always get them backwards. So it looks like a bad caterpillar. Doesn't he look like he's going to sting you if you touch? But he is not. He is a, the... Um, larva of this beautiful, beautiful, large butterfly, almost as big as a monarch, almost as colorful. And uh, I had to throw this in. Somebody sent me this and said, you need your, you need this slide in your talk. And I said, yeah, that's pretty cool. 298 for orgasmic blueberries. I'm sure they meant organic, but. Uh. All right, other ones that are, you should know about is um, a lot of people like these plants that will bloom at night and provide fragrance. So we you know, call these the evening garden, the night garden plants. And the reason they're fragrant, and the reason they're usually white or pale yellow is so the moths can find them in the night. So moon vine is one of those we can on, commonly grow from seed that will do this out in our garden. It doesn't open up the blooms don't until the sun goes down and they release a delicious fragrance. I'm not doing it on time, y'all. You're doing good. Okay, cool. With, uh, 15 minutes. Okay, great. I gotta tell a quick story. Um, my niece was getting married down at the farm in Sesums, and my um, brother had the foresight to put an arbor out there in the lawn. It was going to be a, a sunset wedding and plant moonvine on it. And so the music starting, the bride and groom are coming down the aisle, the moonvine is opening, and the uh, big uh, moths there, they're called sphinx moths or hummingbird moths, began to arrive to pollinate them. They've got very long sphincters. They're really cool and they do look like hummingbirds. So they begin to arrive and they begin to visit the moonflowers over the bride's head and even the bouquets that were being held by the bridesmaids and even the rose petals up and down the aisle that had been strewn. And it was so funny because the person sitting next to me turned around and said, how did y'all get hummingbirds to show up at the wedding? I said, oh, we're, we're just that special. When we go to the ocean, dolphins leap out of the water to greet us. So it kind of distracted from the wedding in a way, but it also made it absolutely unforgettable. Um, let's talk about some plants we should maybe talk people into tolerating more. I uh, found this huge, huge cocoon in my woodland and I kept it around and got it identified and was able to get to witness the fact that it was 
one of the largest North American silk moths. It is the Cecropia moth, and you see he's a boy because he's got that feathery antenna to find the girls, and he's still all fat from coming out of that papery cocoon. Now, I got a really good picture of him close up, this cute little furry face. So a lot of people don't like moths, but this moth um, is absolutely fabulous and a really cool uh, sex life. He only lives eight days, and um, the only feeding you can do for him is as a caterpillar because they have no mouth. As an adult, they've got like eight days for male and female to find each other, breed. And so most of their life is as a caterpillar. And then the cocoon will hang on that appropriate plant throughout the winter months and then hatch out. They do this very quickly and that whole cycle has gone. One might think that's sort of sad, but maybe life as a caterpillar is great, right? Maybe this is the part that's really, really hard. And there's one that's done, done its thing and collapsed. Because the caterpillars are pretty cool looking critters, aren't they? That's pretty awesome, pretty awesome dude right there. He looks like a Chinese um, New Year's parade. I just think that's beautiful. And it's the host plant for not only that, oh, sweet gum is the host plant. And also for the Luna moth, and I know a lot of us love, we get excited, you can look online about how many pictures people take of the, of the Luna moths. Same group of moths, no mouth, and they're gonna feed on sweet gum. So let's encourage people, you know, if you've got a place you can leave those sweet gums out in the perimeter, you know, put those trees, they're fast growing, they'll grow anywhere, they give you good fall color, where the little gumballs don't bother people. It's all about siding some of these fabulous trees is where you put them. You don't want it right on your sidewalk, I'm with you, or right in your perfect lawn, don't do that. But out in the perimeters, it should be fine. And remember, a lot of birds eat the seeds off of these sweet gums too. And the flowers are really cool if you look at them. See, look at, this is the, uh, the, the male flower standing up and ready to release lots of pollen. And then if you'll look to the left in that picture, you see the female flower hanging down and that's gonna make that little a king laden fruit, which is really a fantastic, cool little thing. All right, I'm gonna mention just a little bit about the sex life of bees. We're gonna transition a little bit from plants to uh, knowing what bees are actually up to because they have a really interesting sex life. The queen is a slave. The colony controls everything about the queen. They decide even when they want a new queen, when to throw out the old queen. And don't ask me how they come to that. E.L. Wilson you know, has developed all these theories about um, these animals that are super beings. That as a colony, it's a creature that makes these decisions. And he thinks humans, by the way, are too, but it's interesting. Uh, so we see the worker bees, male bees, and the queen bee. And the queen bee, she, her job is lay eggs. That's it. And they decide when they need a new queen. So they start giving one of the larvae extra stuff, extra royal jelly, extra pollen cake, and they make more than one just to hedge their bets. And the queen bee is the only bee in the colony that has a smooth stinger. And that's because when she hatches first, or the one that does hatch first, she stabs to death the other queens. All right, so there they are making her lay, you know, they're feeding her, they're, she's laying eggs, she's working at it, working at it. She really only gets out of the colony and when she gets kicked out, the old one, well, I'm gonna talk about her prenup fight here in just a minute. Um, the old one leaves, I don't know how they just, you know, decide who goes with the old queen. You can't count off one, two, one, two. Now you ones go with the old queen and you twos are staying here with the new queen. But this is what they do while they're scouting for a new place to <clears throat> set up shop. Now a new queen, let's go back to her. She's got to get bread to be, you know, the egg laying machine she's meant to be. And so she goes out, she's not gonna breed with her own males. You know, we're trying to avoid that, keeping the genes all together. We want new blood coming in. So they go out and find, and the male honeybees, the drones are actually out hanging around these little areas, kind of cloud of drones, and the female will find them. But so this is all done by scent. They mate in the air. When they do, now his appendage has got these cool, weird barbs. Well, I don't know if it's cool for him, because once he pulls away from her after mating, um, it kills him. That, that comes out of his body. He's ruptured and he falls to the ground dead. Um, hopefully he calls it getting lucky. I'm not sure, but it's certainly called hooking up. So that's a wild story. Now drones are pretty useless except for this. And the, um, the, the colony of she bees decided to make a few drones so that, you know, it could go off and pollinate uh, female queens from other drones. But once summer's over, they have no use for them and they starve them to death and they put them outside the hive and they're done with them, so that they just aren't helping. They're they're uh, they're no longer an asset. 
Now, bumblebees will have separate colonies and bumblebees are some of our large bees, our, our little southeast um, blueberry bee, for example. Some of our native bees can do some pollination types that honeybees cannot. So it's very important to garden for these native bees. And even though this is not a, a native crop, if you are gardening for red clover, if you're a red clover seed producer, they are only pollinated by bumblebees. So you really wanna uh, be sure you've got good colony these around. So I discovered this cool kind of pollinating thing they do by discovering this wildflower, and this is Rexia. Rexia is real common in our woodlands, I mean, our, our fields out here in the wetland areas in, in late summer. It's a beautiful native perennial. We probably ought to grow it more as an ornamental. And I looked close and I thought, that is one weird flower structure that's gotta have a story. And sure enough, it does. Um, what it does, there, you've heard a bee in a flower doing all kinds of zzz, 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 zzz. And you're like, what in the world is going on in there? And you'll look at them, they're kind of tumbling around in there. They're actually trying to find the right vibration. And when they do, it causes those male anthers to rupture and blow pollen all over his little hairy body. And then he can go take that to the other flower. So if that flower reminds you of tomato plants, it should because tomato plants also benefit from this type of uh, pollination. It's called sonication or buzz pollination. When they first started trying to grow greenhouse tomatoes, they hired people to hold vibrators up to the male flower, up to the flowers, excuse me, they're perfect, to the flowers of plants to get good tomato set. Now, then they started putting bumblebees in the greenhouses and now I think they bred tomatoes where this is no longer necessary. But I'd love to have that on my job resume. Um, that I held vibrators to tomato plants for my first botanical job. Cool little plants. Look at those great little seed urns. They're awesome, aren't they? Um, by the way, if you'll look, uh, if you're interested, a lot of times you'll find a bumblebee asleep on a flower in the morning. Usually it's the male because again, the male's not really welcome back at the bumblebee colony because he's not bringing home pollen for the colony. Um, so look at him close. That's the male on the left. He doesn't have the little pollen bags. The females will have the pollen bags, plus the male is hairier, which you might expect, right? That's kind of typical with us as well. Um, come winter now, he's not going to be, he's not going to make it, nor are most of the worker bees in that colony. It's only the queen bee in that underground colony that survives, starts laying eggs, and starts a colony again in the next year. A lot of cool things about bees, just a couple of other places that you might want to explore. <clears throat> Now, just remember to encourage people to keep these. I had people who swore that toads were killing their plants, but actually they're great predators in our landscape and they're gonna need some water. You know, these are amphibians, toads and frogs to um, reproduce. So a lot of people are worried about that. They don't wanna leave standing water around because of the fact that um, it might breed mosquitoes. But I have never had that a problem where I have tadpoles, I don't find mosquito larvae. So, and there are also products that could kill mosquito larva. Uh, the BTs, for example, you could float dunk around in that, but I love to hear them sing. I've got 11 different species of frogs and toads around my house that I've identified by sound. I haven't seen them all, but there's some good sites that will tell you about sound. Now, toads are pretty rude. Um, the male toad gets this long, beautiful trill and the female appreciates that he's the sexiest singer and she will appreciate that so much that she comes to him and it's only males that sing. Then there are uh, ones that don't sing as well and they call them the satellite males that are gonna surround the good singers and they may mob her if she approaches the one she wants. And if the water is a little too deep, they can drown her. They call them mating balls. It's a terrible thing. So toad sex is pretty rough and rude. Bullfrogs are much more considerate. Um, the female does like the male with the deeper, louder voice and they have territories around the pond. So she will approach that male and the other males respect that. And then the two will swim off in the water together and he embraces her and all the fertilization takes place in the water. It's kind of like that old story about getting pregnant in the swimming pool. That is what happens uh, with, with the frogs and toads. So uh, that's interesting. And in fact, if you look up bullfrog wrestling, when they are setting up their territories around the pond, uh, a male bullfrog does not want to tolerate another male bullfrog in his particular territory. And they throw themselves at each other like sumo wrestlers. I am not kidding. I've got them in my pond and I haven't ever gotten to witness it in person, but I'm often out there with my glasses, uh, binoculars when they're calling, hoping I can catch some acts of sumo wrestling bullfrogs. Bullfrog tadpoles are cool, by the way. They're huge. They can live up to four years in places where the 
summers are shorter. Here it's usually two years before they mature into a bullfrog, but golly, they're, they're, they're really awesome. I didn't know about spadefoots until um, I moved to my new house, which had never been farmed, which I think was important. It was steep, rocky, sorry land. And so the ground had never been disturbed. And that's, that's why I think I have heard spadefoots there. And it's the only place I've ever heard them, uh, though it's actually a pretty common frog in the Southeast. We had had seven inches of rain after one of those hurricane systems came through. And finally, I was able to let the dogs out on the driveway to pee. And I could hear water rushing all through the valley. And I also heard a very odd sound in the woods going, Rah! just the most horrible sound, somebody stomping on a great blue heron. I thought, I don't know what that is, but it's gotta be something in the frog family. So I went and looked it up on one of those sites. Leaps.Tennessee is, is a really good frog site. And it turns out this is a, a toad frog. You know, they're really the same. Um, that lives underground its entire life until we have enormous rains. And then it rushes above ground and breeds, they call it orgy breeding, and lays its eggs in these ephemeral puddles. And it's very quick, the whole thing, the tadpoles go through their whole metamorphosis very quick. And it's so that they won't be having to lay their eggs where there are predators. But a really interesting plant, uh, toad, if you look them up, spadefoots, and there's their little spade that they dig underground. They dig under backwards. They live underground eating insects and, and grubs and stuff their entire life. Really cool. And there they are. All right. I probably, if I got enough, just a little more time, people don't like skinks. 10 minutes. Of, 10 minutes. Little, little snaky looking, I admit it. But they are, again, very good predators. I love to see them. Um, I have raised beds built of concrete blocks and they live right there in my vegetable garden, which I'm thrilled. We'll have help uh, take care of the insect issues. Now they do a cool little thing. Um, the females kind of get together as a colony and they will all put their little eggs close together because they will actually help guard each other's eggs while one needs to go out and hunt for something to eat or drink. And it's uh, kind of a, we're gonna raise this as a community, we're gonna make babies. And I thought that was really sweet. Now people love to hate dirt divers. I grew up on a farm and I know how many times the problem is there's a dirt dauber, a mud dauber nest in that piece of equipment that won't work or won't crank. So I get that. And I know some people don't like to see the little homes that they construct on our walls, but I'm gonna ask you to look at this differently. That's a little mama, right? She's trying to make babies and goodness, look at what she's doing, toting insects back to pack into those wonderful colonies. The cicada wasps, look what these beautiful big wasps, very mild mannered, not gonna bother you. They are toting these gigantic cicadas back to their little burrow to pack down in there, lay an egg or two on. And then, by the way, they give more eggs to the females than the males um, because they need more uh, nutrient. And they even can tell that in the egg stage. And, and they can't even fly well with these things. They fly a little piece and then they'll climb back up on a post or a, a sapling and launch themselves off again, fly as far as they can before they hit the ground. It's a lot of work. That is. That's hard work. Don't stomp them. Don't stomp them. They're on our side. There she is stinging and pair. They paralyze them. They don't really kill these insects because they want it to be fresh for their larva when those eggs hatch out. Look at the little mama. She is packing little mud balls. Now the male will kind of guard her while he's doing it. He's not totally useless, but she's doing all the building. She's got to go find mud puddles. And if she does, she starts to make chambers and she goes and paralyzes spiders. And that's her larval food. And she packs those chambers full of little paralyzed spiders. You ever break this open? Look at them. They're moving very slowly like zombies. I also think it's cool. Look on the left. See all the different colors of mud? She had to go to different puddles when it was drier and had to collect different kinds of mud. So you can kind of see there um, as the area <coughs> got wetter or drier, <coughs> the different soil she had to use to make her babies. <clears throat> so those of you who hate spiders may be glad to have dirt daubers, although I encourage those of you who hate spiders to think of the fact that spider web, one of the most important components of your hummingbird nest. Without spider web, you would not have hummingbird nests. So remember that too. I'm trying to convert my man friend to be a spider lover. I'm having a hard go of it. Dragonflies were one of your best mosquito predators. You know, the, the Swallows that get so much attention really don't eat a lot of mosquitoes. That's too small of a payback for the energy that it takes to catch 
a mosquito. They prefer to go after the larger insects. But dragonflies go after them, and they go after deer flies and all those things that bite us when we're out there. And also, their young will, their um, underground, their underwater larvae. So this guy, by the way, you might think this is a, a, a sexual thing, a reproductive thing, sticking that tail up in the air like, look at me, ain't I cool and tall? But it's not. It's actually called the oblique position. And you, if you look, it's always pointed at the sun. And it's a way to reduce the amount of sunlight striking his body so that he can stay cooler on a hot day. All right, well, here we got it going on. We got a male and a female, and that looks so sweet. It's got a heart shape, doesn't it? It is not sweet. She has grabbed, she is grabbed. She's the one on the bottom. He grabbed her, look at his tail by the back of her neck, and he has clamped down and he ain't letting go till she gives it up. So she does, she lifts her parts up to him and that's where the exchange goes on, but he's still in letting her go because he didn't want another male impregnating his woman. So then he carries her over to the water and drags her around while she lays the eggs. So you may have seen this. I've actually seen it with some really dumb male dragonflies out here in the parking lot banging the girl on blue shiny hoods of cars thinking it was water. So it's, it's rough stuff, dragonfly sex, probably not that much fun. There's that oblique position. I, I thought that was coming up here. I do, they're very cool insects. They're dragonfly societies, by the way, if you want to pursue that further. And there's our dragonfly nymph. It can not only eat lots and lots of mosquito larvae, but even small minnows. They're pretty fierce, cool creatures. Look them up. There's a lot of uh, YouTube videos of, of dragonfly larvae eating stuff. All right, I'll start winding it up. Um, mainly, I want you to talk your clients into letting you plant what I call multi-purpose plants for wildlife. You know, a lot of people want to screen. Well, there's no reason a screen can't be several different, we encourage it to be several different mixed species. It can provide cover for lots of wildlife nesting places, for example, it doesn't have to provide, you know, food for everything. All, all plants don't need to provide all things. Some are just going to provide cover. Uh, our native anise tree, it doesn't have anything particular for wildlife. In fact, it's toxic, it's foliage is for wildlife, but it provides great cover and it'll thrive in a whole lot of different situations. And it's a fantastic screen plant. So if you pick these multi-purpose, so I call it a bountiful boundary. Instead of a screen, why not a bountiful boundary that provides cover, flowers for our pollinators, edible foliage, mix some in there, you know, so there'll be some intact plants when the caterpillars are eating up some of the other plants. And then the fruits, some of our favorite birds, for example, bluebirds, um, woodpeckers, cardinals, thrashers, they live on um, dried seeds, dried berries through the winter months because there are no insects for them at that time. And then of course, pretty, we want pretty plants. So you can get all of those with the right plant selection. I'm gonna end there. Um, I know we could, I could go on about this forever and I have learned. <laughs> That I could go on about this forever. One of the things to get note is understanding your flaws. Um, I do have like five minutes for questions if y'all want to try that. Well, we could listen to you forever too, Carol. That's the, <laughs> that's the problem here, or the good part. It was very excellent. I appreciate it. And yeah, we do have five more minutes to pull us up to the top of the hour. That'd be great if anybody... I shared that um, several years ago, the Volkswagen uh, plant called me and said they had all these black spots on their the hoods of their darker cars and so we went over there and observed for a while and finally we discovered I scratched off some of it and saw all the eggs and uh, realized it was dragonflies because they were trying to encourage I mean that plant is right in the middle of a nice wild wild uh, area with the wetness it was a pond area so they were so they put white covers on their hoods just to try to keep that off. That's great. And I am having, you know, landscapers report that the their customers now are requesting, you know, ways to, you know, they don't want to all the chemicals these days. And they're asking for more diverse landscapes and ways to control problems. And diverse landscapes are a great way to do that. So there is demand. Um, we need to exploit that, I think, you know, for the good of everything and also because it's economic opportunity. These are often the more educated people that are probably gonna pay, pay more for that type of um, approach to their landscapes. 
Great, Carol. Well, that was really, really wonderful, Carol. Thanks so much. Here I was Thank thinking you. you were a plant person, but you're so much more than that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Record um, our I'm, Tennessee Extension Service. So server. much more, yeah. Thank you. I'm a, I'm a voyeur, right? <laughs> there you go. I walk There's around and just look at stuff, and this is what's going on, y'all. They're ba making babies out here. <laughs> that was a great topic. Thank you for joining us, Carol. Thank you, and I hope I made it a part of the landscape industry. I, I do think it's important. Thank y'all. Absolutely. Okay, we'll transition over to Dr. Florence. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, up next, I'd like to introduce, of course, Dr. Robert Florence. Uh, he's been to multiple of our grounds management short courses here in Knoxville and probably Chattanooga as well. Always happy to have Dr. Florence with the University of Tennessee. Uh, Robert is the lab director of the Soil Plant and Pest Center in Nashville, which as you all know, last week we had pretty much the whole soil plant and pest center on the call. Uh, Robert received his PhD in soil fertility and of course his role there at the Soil Plant and Pest Center is organizing testing and getting results and recommendations out to uh, all of the sample providers throughout the state of Tennessee. Of course, Robert works with us as county agents regularly, but also residents as well. So let's uh, introduce and glad you're here, Dr. Florence and the floor is yours. Awesome, thank you for the introduction. Yeah, so um, I have, I was gonna talk about uh, soil formation, soil compaction and heavy metals. And so there, um, I broke it down in three separate talks with like a little bit of questions after each section, just in case you wanna have questions in the chat, I can I can talk to them then or at the very end, I, either way. Um, but I thought it'd be best to, to focus on the three separate things as opposed to try to meld them all together at one time. And so the first one is soil formation. So the um, soil formation, uh, or the study of it, is called pedology, and it was uh, started in, in the United States by Dr. Hans Jenny, and he came up uh, with this idea of uh, soil forming factors, right? Like, what are the main things that form a soil? And so uh, climate, organisms, relief, paramaterial, and time are the five main things that will uh, form a soil. And they interact with each other at times, and we'll talk about that. And I try to make it relate to, to landscapers and importance to landscapers. And there's also a sixth one that that he didn't talk about, but you know was was evident and was later went into detail later. But it's it's us, it's humans, and how we affect the soil, how we change it, um, and and manipulate those other five forming factors. So uh, all of those factors come together to form soils, right? And there's many different soils. And, the uh, pedologists will classify them into 12 main orders, right? So these are those 12 main soils out there, and they have all kind of different characteristics, different depths, different paramaterial. And I mostly threw this out there just um, to relate it to landscapers, because uh, sometimes you talk to the people and they say, oh, I bought topsoil, I brought it in, why is it not working? And mostly the idea is topsoil is just literally the top of the soil. And so it can be, it could be sand, it could be clay, it could be loam. It could be anything, right? Or it could be an eroded soil and they took the subsoil that was the top of the soil. So mostly, you know, just bring across the idea that soil is not the same. It's different uh, pretty much all across the U.S. and even different within Tennessee. So uh, when people say they buy topsoil, you may have to ask them, you know, what was the organic matter of it? What was its texture? You know, was it, uh, what was there any soil structure to it? So uh, just a way of like, getting people to tell you more about the topsoil they bought or get them to think about if they go buy topsoil, start asking those questions ahead of time because topsoil in Tennessee is not topsoil in Ohio, is not topsoil in Florida. And also um, the way that the pedologists will classify soils to kind of break them up into groups is they'll look at the pedon, right? So the pedon is that, that depth of its development or how much it's been developed. And, and like classic textbooks, you have like an O horizon, an A horizon, the B horizon, the C horizon, maybe an R horizon. They just break it down by, by what it is. The O would be the organic matter, a heavy layer of organic matter. The A is where you have organic matter kind of mixing with the minerals of that weathered, weathered rock. These, you have more developments, so like maybe more soil structure, maybe more mineral development or clay development. And C would be that weathered, weathered rock, and then R would be, would be bedrock itself. And so we can kind of see an example of a pedon on the right. And you can, you can kind of see like 
I mean, it wouldn't really be an O horizon, but you can see a lot of organic and an A horizon, and then maybe even a B or an E horizon, where some of those minerals have been weathered by rain and roots to dissolve, go into solution, and then go down further in the soil and precipitate back out as another clay mineral, or maybe just the transport of that clay mineral itself. And so it's, uh, and I'll talk more about how that's going to affect landscapers, but you kind of know that uh, in Tennessee, there's a lot of clay soils, and that really messes with, with landscapes in Tennessee. So we have a lot of the, the heavy clay soils or well-developed soils in Tennessee because of, uh, mostly because of our annual precipitation and warm soils, right? So we have a lot of rain, so maybe 50 to 70 inches of rainfall per year in Tennessee, maybe a little less in the north, uh, the northeast corner. And it's also pretty warm, right? So the annual average temperature is 55 to 60 degrees Fahrenheit, right? So we just don't have the winters that you would have far north. So microbes are always working, plants are kind of always working. There's always something working at the soil and there's enough rainwater to keep washing the soil and having it develop. So our soils are pretty, pretty weathered and developed. Uh, and another thing that we wanted to point out uh, of an important uh, to landscapers is soil organic matter, right? So one of the reasons why soils in the southeast are very low in organic matter is because we have a lot of rain, so we have uh, ability for microbes to work, and we have warm soils, right? The microbes are pretty much constantly working on the soil. It may slow down in the winter, but they don't really stop, right? Farther north you go, you have a, a frozen winter, a frozen soil. Those microbes stop working, and you have a chance for that organic matter residue to build up over time. But in the southeast, those microbes just work at it and work at it and work at it. So we just have, it's hard to build a soil organic matter, and uh, it's always going to keep getting eaten by those microbes due to our warm soil and a lot of rainwater. And then also, all that rain uh, that helps develop the clays creates a problem for landscapers, right? Because you can dig a hole in a Tennessee soil and fill it with water, and it's just going to pond. It's going to sit there, right? Because the clay just doesn't let it drain down. Um, and I think I saw that Tom had a question about, you know, uh, if you dig a hole and it was, about, it was about using engineered soil or filling it in, like you can fill in a hole with engineered soil, but if the soil itself doesn't drain well, it, it is essentially just a yeah, clay pot, right? So um, it's while it's good if you had a compacted soil to fill it in with some engineered soil or some organic matter to loosen the soil to help with the compaction. But the other component of that is the drainage. So if the soil, if the water can't drain down at least help it drain out or somewhere else. So the, and those are two kind of components that even on the next segment I had to wrestle with was, am I talking about compaction or I'm talking about drainage? And so just keep that in mind, you know, if you're talking with homeowners or with like HOAs, you know, or is the problem compaction or is the problem drainage or are they the one and the same, right? There's got to work that out sometimes. And if you see on the picture on the right, if you ever dig down and you see a gray soil, that means that that soil has been wet for a very long time. and It's probably not going to drain. It's a bad sign for, uh, for drainage, right? So if you ever see all the deep, dark red soils, that's iron that's been oxidized. So oxygen has been able to get down in the soil, oxidize the iron, makes it turn red. But if you take iron and you put it in water or an anaerobic environment for a very long time, it'll turn gray. So if you ever dig down in a soil, you start to see a gray layer. That means that that's going to stay pretty wet for a long time, or it's been saturated for a very long time. So it's it's a uh, an indicator to look out for that you may have trouble on drainage. Uh, so we talked about climate as one of the soil forming factors. So I talked about parent material, parent material. So the parent material it, itself is one of them, right? So they're made of individual elements, whether it's alumina, silica, iron manganese, boron, potassium, right? all the individual elements, and then those will come together to form compounds. And if you take those compounds or elements and you put them in a, a crystalline form order, then you have minerals. And if you have minerals and you put them together, sometimes you'll form rocks. And you can also have organic matter itself be a parent material, right? You can just have an organic soil with very little mineral component. So or the organic matter um, can also be a parent material. And on the picture on the right, I just wanted to show, so I took uh, I took some soil just randomly from the lab and I washed it off with the silt and clay and I had the sand remain. I put it under Dr. Wyndham's microscope just for fun. And you can see all the different colors and minerals and rocks of that 
that weathered soil, right? It's, these are just the sand particles in the soil. So um, they're just sand sized minerals that have been left behind. And you can see that's where the color from the soil is gonna come from. You may get some red, you may get some clear, you may get some, some brown, um, but it's just pretty neat to see all the different minerals uh, in the soil. You can't really see the silicon clay minerals because they're, they're so tiny, you can't see them under a microscope, um, but it'd be pretty cool if you could. And then, so the paramaterial um, is important for, for you guys because uh, one, one main thing is in Middle Tennessee, so in Middle Tennessee, we're built off phosphatic limestone. So the soils are naturally high in phosphorus and high in, in carbonates. So we have a high phosphorus soil that's also high in pH. So a lot of times they're running against, um, people want plants that need acidic soils and they have to lower the pH a lot to make that happen. Or they're over applying phosphorus and they don't need to apply phosphorus um, from an environmental standpoint, right? So that's always good to test your soil to know what uh, what do you need, right? Is your parent material affecting that those nutrients? Um, and you can also see that uh, there's different. This, these are just different soils of the of Tennessee. You can have like very shallow soils out in the east that will affect your your soil depth or your water holding capacity. Um, so parent material transport. Um, so this is just things in general, right? So you can have plus like windblown silt. It'll form different soils. Um, soils can also be moved by water. They can be an alluvial soil. They can build civilizations, like having that silt getting deposited year after year and replenishing nutrients. You can also have a little bit of sand on the, the edges of it where the sand washes out. You can have uh, soil be formed from rocks underneath, right, from volcanoes. It's pretty cool to have a, a soil come from volcanic uh, from from lava, so these would be called andic soils. You can also have soils that form from trapped uh, parent material, right? So it used to be that the ocean went all the way up to this green part of Alabama, and this was a big depression, like a real depressed geologic area. So when the oceans receded, the ocean water stayed behind and all those ocean organisms stayed behind, but eventually it drained out and the organisms died and those soil minerals stayed behind and it made a different soil entirely than the surrounding soil. So these are, are vertisoils. Vertisoils are soils that uh, shrink swell a lot. So you'll have some of these in West Tennessee, um, but just another way that, that soils are, are formed, right? Like maybe the soil was trapped there or the organisms were trapped and then it formed a new soil. Um, you can also have parent material interact with relief. So relief is another forming soil forming factor and relief is just um, kind of like the pitch of a, a soil and also the direction it's like north facing south facing west facing and so you can have residuum where soil forms at the very top of a mountain or top of a hill where it just forms in place right and it doesn't have to be at the top of a mountain it can be on a long plain where it just forms in place it doesn't move anywhere it just formed right where it was or let's say uh, the residuum formed up tall and then there was gravity that worked on it and made it go down that would be a colluvium soil right so you'd have colluvium down here and in the middle you'd have a different soil altogether there may not be a lot of chance for soils to develop but further down here you'll have a chance for soils to develop different characteristics whether it's clay development or deeper depths um, or even for those minerals to, to change so at the top of a hill or mountain you'll have one soil in the middle you'll have another at the very bottom you'll have a different soil entirely you may even have colluvium over residuum, or there may be a river that came through here and you'll have colluvium over alluvium or alluvium over colluvium. You can have all kinds of different patterns. So if you ever start digging in a soil and you see uh, different soil, abrupt soil texture changes or round pebbles and then hard, uh, sharp angled pebbles, like that just means that there's a different pair of material that happened uh, at some point in time. So another soil forming factor are organisms and plants being one of them. And this is a very extreme example, but I thought it'd be cool just to, to show it. So this is, these are called spotosols. So this is where uh, plants will, um, they'll use their roots to send out organic acids. Those organic acids will dissolve a lot of the minerals, leaving only the sand, like the silica uh, sand behind, right? So they'll dissolve all the minerals, the rainwater will wash those minerals deeper down until they precipitate back out, right? It will dry out or they'll precipitate to form a new, 
a new mineral, um, but it'll leave this just the, the bare sand behind itself. And so you can kind of see the effect that the plants can have on rocks or soil. Is it, those acids over a geologic time period can be quite quite effective. And uh, and this is a, an extreme example. So sometimes we'll get phone calls and people say, "Well, I have a couple pine trees. Why is it my soil acidic?" And well, it, it, the pine needles, while they are somewhat acidic, it would take a geologic time period for those pine trees to really acidify a soil. Then also remember your parent material, right? If your parent material was limestone or, cal or phosphatic limestone, it's going to take a lot of acid to lower that, that soil of particular pH. So you know, I just think it's pretty neat sometimes where uh, you'll get phone calls maybe that they, they have to add lime because there's a pine tree or some acidic plant, but you know, not on a human time scale is that going to change. It's mostly going to be on a, a geologic time scale. Animals will also work on the soil, whether it's good for bad, right? So large animals will burrow in the soil, they'll churn the soil, they'll mix it up. Small animals uh, will also help help with that, making the bulk density uh, less, so you have more aeration in the soil. And sometimes you want those animals, sometimes you don't want those animals or those insects. And same thing for microscopic, so the microbes will, will work on the soil. Um, sometimes they're nematodes and you don't want them. Sometimes they're beneficial bacteria. I'm just kind of bringing in the idea that you know, animals are also part of the soil forming factor and then microbes as well. So bacteria and fungi. And then also, uh, so you can get an interaction between organisms and climate. And so I just wanted to throw this out there. So uh, this picture on the left is from, uh, I think it's from Scotland, but essentially it's organic matter that is built up year after year after year, right? So they have enough water for plants to grow. And it's not so cold that the plants don't stop growing, so they have continual growth. And so the, the plants will grow, they'll leave their plant, plant matter or plant residue year after year, and it'll build up. So there's very little mineral soil here, very little rock that's been weathered. This is just plant residue over a geologic time period that built upon itself, and it's called a histosol. So it's an organic soil. And then over on the right, um, you have a very dry land where the plants just don't grow as strong or as much. Um, so you'll have very little soil development on top of the bedrock. And so you have a shallow soil, which is the nice contrast of uh, how organisms and the climate can, can interact with each other. Then also time, right? So time can affect the soil, whether you have a really deep soil, right? So windblown lust is just piled up over a geologic time period, or um, it's a brand new soil, right? And you probably run across a lot of this uh, in East Tennessee and in Central Tennessee, um, where you're trying to have grass grow on a on bare rock, and it's just hard to hard to get it to do. But it it uh, it can be done, I guess, if you have irrigation. But without irrigation, it's a it's a hard battle to to fight. So also just keep in mind, like, uh, you know, the, what's the depth of your soil? Because that's going to affect your water holding capacity. So a real deep soil that's maybe a loam or clay will hold a lot more water. And a real shallow soil is just not going to hold a lot of water. Uh, so try to use plants that are uh, more water conservative. And I think Dr. Lugwood did a good job of, of listing those plants out uh, that you may, may want to use in either a real wet environment or, or a dryer environment. And then I thought this would be uh, just a neat map to show you guys. So this is the soil order map of Tennessee. And I broke it down by the intersoil. So intersoils are very brand new soil. So you're going to see a lot of very shallow soils, very shallow depth to bedrock. It happens a lot over East Tennessee. Ultasols are really weathered soils. They're going to be low in base saturation. So just low in calcium, magnesium, potassium. Um, you'll have alpha sols that are not quite as weathered as ultasols, so they'll be a little bit higher in those calcium, magnesium, potassium uh, elements. And then alpha sol or molosols that'll be darker, so a little bit more organic matter, and a little bit higher in base saturation. I don't know why in particular, why those pop up in, in that part of Tennessee, but it's kind of neat that they do. And then also um, along the Mississippi, you can have some more vertisols, where there's the high shrink swell soils, so you'll have a lot of 
um, just a high shrinks well sometimes the landscapers or or homeowners have trouble because they have foundation trouble right the the soil has shifted on them their house is moving and now they get new foundation work and so now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, about compaction and how to how to work with it and I was trying to uh, also try to separate that idea between compaction and drainage so you'll see that the, at the end I kind of try to address both so what are common causes of compaction? Uh, people, right? Whether it's people making desire paths um, or that walking where they want to walk in the landscape, which I think are, are um, you know, it, it makes sense. Evidently, there's a whole group of, uh, a whole society on Reddit dedicated to finding desire paths. So if you ever wanted to, to kill a few moments finding how different people have walked across landscapes, killing a landscape, uh, just Google desire paths is kind of neat. Um, another way is construction. So uh, this picture was taken by, by Dr. Wyndham uh, a few years ago when they were doing development uh, next to his place. And uh, this was going to be called the preserve. But you can see you have heavy machinery, moving soil, taking all the topsoil off. You're working with subsoil. And just the heavy machinery itself running over the soil is kind of compacted. And so there have been several studies that have shown that construction sites will increase the soil bulk density by half a gram per cubic centimeter, all right? And that can be huge, because uh, that's gonna really impact, uh, impact what you have to deal with as a landscaper, right? Because you don't have any control over, over the contractors moving their heavy equipment over that ground. You come in usually after the fact, and you have to lay the sod or, or, lay, or put the trees and shrubs in. So just be aware that you're probably gonna get bad soil to start off with and be prepared to, to fix it or you know, try to work with it. Um, so how do you measure compaction? So it's pretty, pretty easy. Um, you just take a steel metal ring, you pound it in the ground, and then you, you pull it out, you dry it, and you weigh the soil, you know the, the area of the, or the, the volume of the metal ring, and then you have your, your bulk density in grams per cubic centimeters. Sometimes you can hammer it straight down into the soil. Sometimes people will dig kind of a little profile and, and then hammer it into the soil kind of horizontally through each horizon to see how how deep that, that compaction goes, but it's a pretty simple process to, to measure bulk density. And I wanted to give you an idea of like bulk density ranges, um, just so you had to have an idea of what is a common one. And so this is just straight out of a, you know, a, uh, a basic soils textbook, but you know, it's somewhere around one gram per cubic centimeter, right? A, you know, depending on a loam, silt loam or clay or sand, it's, it's in that one gram per cubic centimeter of an uncultivated soil. If it's cultivated in agricultural, you'll start to get a little bit more dense bulk densities. And so if you remember um, that if on average construction sites increase a bulk density by half a gram, and you're starting off at one gram per cubic centimeter, and usually the, you know, uh, you get woody plant growth can be limited between 1.4 or 1.65. And it's also very similar for like grasses. Like once you go by that 1.5 mark that Dr. Ludwig was also talking about, you really start to run out of trouble. So if you start off at one and your construction site makes it 1.5 or 1.6, then you've already ran into, into trouble ahead of time and you haven't even got, gotten onto your site yet. So just be aware that uh, uh, running into, into danger on construction sites is, is pretty prevalent. What is it affected by? So bulk density is affected by the sand, silt, and clay content. It's affected by the organic matter, right? Organic matter is so light that if you mix that in with the mineral soil, it'll, it'll balance out that, that weight, right? It's so light, it's got a lot of air to it. Also soil structure, right? So that organic matter will interact with the sand, silt, and clay. And over time, you may get good soil structure, like macropores, and micropores. And the more of those you get, uh, the lighter that bulk density will be as well. And also just voids, whether it's caused by ants or earthworms or other kind of, uh, you know, small insects that will help improve your, your soil bulk density. But, you know, it's kind of sporadic on, onto where is it going to help you out over time. And so what does compaction cause? So it, uh, in trees, it can cause decreased root length decreased trunk diameter, and mostly surface roots. So this is a, I tried to go 
find like studies on soil compaction that, that were done. And it, there's not that many uh, recently, but there are some from like the 80s and early 90s. And this was a really cool study where they looked at uh, bulk density and oxygen level uh, effect on, a, on trees. So uh, in this report, they looked at oxygen because a compacted soil prevents oxygen from getting into the soil, right? So you, uh, one common thing to worry about is water, water getting into the soil for those roots. But another is oxygen because the roots need to breathe, but they need to do cellular respiration in order to do their thing, in order to grow. So if they can't get oxygen, then they're not going to be able to grow either. So what uh, these uh, researchers did was they found some, got some trees. They found a site that was low in oxygen and high in oxygen. And uh, I may have mislabeled this. This may be the, the high oxygen. This is the low oxygen. But you may be asking, where did they find a low oxygen environment? Uh, they actually went to a landfill because as that landfill makes its gases, you'll have one area that is lower in oxygen, another area that may be higher. So they found out which ones are lower, which ones are higher. And then they put trees on there and they studied the root growth. And so you can see in a lower bulk density, and this is the high oxygen. I'm sorry, I, I put that on there wrong. The, you have a lot more root area growth outside the drip line um, in the lower bulk density. And then also where there's low oxygen, or, um, the rooting depth is also deeper in the lower bulk density area. But once the bulk density gets really high, it's just real shallow roots. And also in the low oxygen environment, the roots stay very close to the surface because the oxygen just can't get any deeper down. So they're trying to stay close to the surface to get oxygen. And they also just have that mechanical penetration problem. They can't go any deeper down. And so one of the things that these researchers said uh, in, their, in their findings was, if you come across a compacted soil or a soil that may be low in oxygen, instead of digging a really deep hole, dig a really wide hole, right? Give, give space for those roots to grow long and wide close to the surface so they can always get their oxygen as a way of, instead of digging you know, a small hole, but really deep down, right? That, because the oxygen is gonna have a hard time going all the way deeper down. So that was a neat uh, conclusion that, that I thought they had was digging a wider hole was better than digging just a deeper hole at times. Um, so solutions to soil compaction, you know, so in turf, you just do core aeration, right? And then on top of the aeration, you fill it in with organic matter, right? Because we have clay soils. If you aerate a clay soil, it gets wet again, it's gonna collapse back upon itself. So aerate it and then fill in those holes with organic matter. So when it tries to collapse back upon itself, it has some pressure, it has something working against it, right? That'll allow oxygen to get in deeper down to the roots, it'll allow water to get deeper back, deeper down, and it'll help the those uh, that that turf out, those turf roots out. Um, there was also, I think, an earlier question about, you know, one one side of the grass stays wet and another stays dry, and what to do about the wet area. So there were some studies we talked about turf grass compaction and its and its effect, and it's kind of a a negative feedback cycle, right? So if you have a compacted soil on turf grass, the roots can't grow as well. Because the roots can't grow as well, they don't use as much water, and because they don't use as much water. All of a sudden, they can't get as much oxygen because it's now an anaerobic environment. So it kind of a it's just a bad feedback cycle. Um, but if the soil was good and the roots were growing well, they would use the water. And as that rainwater came, they would use the water up, suck it up, um, and it would go off with either evapotranspiration or some other form. So it's kind of a a cycle where maybe if you fix the compaction, you get those roots going again, and they can actually suck up water and uh, and evapotranspirate that water off. Then you may have a it may work out, but it may also be that there's a drainage problem as well that one we want to look into. Um, so some solutions to like tree and shrub compaction. Uh, uh, so one is like radial trenching, or it can also be called vertical trenching, where you just kind of you, you dig a trench straight out from the tree trunk out to the drip line. You work some organic matter into those trenches, or at least make it nice and light and fluffy. Um, and so the, the resource for this is actually from University of Florida and have a little link that one can find. Another way to do it is vertical mulching. So instead of digging trenches, they took like an auger, whether it was a hand auger or like a powered auger, and just dig holes out 
from the tree trunk to the drip line, and then within those holes filled in organic matter or some kind of other soil amendment to help that oxygen get deeper down, give those roots a place to grow to as well. And then another method that uh, Cornell has is the scoop and dump. Um, so you essentially add inches of organic matter. You take a, a backhoe or something and you scoop up the soil, you mix it well, all that organic matter you just added, you dump it back down and uh, in that, that should work. This is mostly probably not a, uh, not a in place thing. This is probably a before anything happens or a big renovation. And I hope that he's working backwards and not forwards because that heavy, uh, heavy machinery is going to compact that soil some more. So hopefully he's working backwards and not forwards. Uh, another thing that was looked into and, and still can be done is air injection. And so there was a, a literature review and also a study uh, by, by uh, a guy named Dr. Hodge in 1993 over in the United Kingdom. And so and they found inconsistencies in their experiment and in previous literature with just air injection into the soil, trying to loosen that soil up with air injection. Things they found out where they suggest that soil moisture and plasticity at the time of injection is critical. So was the soil wet? Was it dry? How wet was it? How dry was it? Like the timing of the injection, the soil moisture of the, of the injection is real critical if it's going to work or not. And they also suggest that it improves tree condition only when the compacted layers are the main cause of the decline and not something else, right? Uh, if the compacted layers aren't the main cause of the decline, then that's not going to help out. And I wanted to make sure that uh, this idea of air injection was not to be confused with using air as a vertical mulch or air pressure to expose roots, right? Those are two separate things. This idea of air injection, they were just shooting air deep down into the soil and hoping it would cause fissures. To, to cause cracks to loosen the soil up. Um, and it's different from, you know, using air as vertical mulch or air pressure to expose roots. So I didn't want to uh, make anybody mad with mixing those two ideas up. Some solutions to desire path you can uh, do as Ohio State did and pave over them. Uh, another university just did pine straw over it, which works just as well, right? These are, you know, just interesting, fun ways to uh, solve problems that. You may just have to work with what you have. And then I threw in a slide for solutions to drainage, um, right, as a way to, it may not be compaction, maybe drainage. So kind of like what Dr. Lugwood was saying, maybe, maybe you have a wet area, maybe make it a rain garden. Maybe try doing some tile drainage. Um, maybe make a, a nice little stone, stone path or a little rock garden path. Um, so there's different ways to, uh, to look at drainage. Now, what should you not do? Don't incorporate sand. Right, so it's okay to have like a, a, a vertical sand trench that one may do on a golf course, or if you, if you dig a trench and you fill it with just sand or, or high sand and organic matter to have an underground drainage, that's fine, but don't incorporate sand. So don't mix sand with silt and clay soil. That's gonna, that sand is gonna fill in all the voids between the silt and the clay, and the clay is gonna fill all the voids between each other, and you're gonna get a brick. So a brick is about two grams per cubic centimeter. So and one and a half grams is bad. Two grams is pretty bad. Uh, so don't incorporate sand. And then uh, don't always rely on frost-free cycles. So like, um, you know, one of the soil forming factors was climate and frost-free cycles do help break up rocks and break up soil. Um, but don't always rely on that in Tennessee to help break up soil compaction. So these are the uh, extreme frost lines. Um, and so in Tennessee, the extreme frost line could be somewhere between nine and 19 inches. But again, this is like extreme. It also has to be wet all the way down through that depth when it freezes for it to you know, expand and crack a soil and then come back down. And also it's not gonna be permanent, right? It's just like aerating a soil without filling it in with organic matter. If it's a heavy clay soil, once it gets wet again and it gets smushed, it's gonna collapse back upon itself. So um, don't always rely upon frost-free cycles to help with the pack. Hey, Robert, what about soil? conditioners prior to planting. I know you kind of talked about not just throwing, you know, one thing in particular. It fixes soil. Again, what, what's the goal? Obviously, like you mentioned, much wider with that soil conditioner over the entire planting area. Yeah, like, I mean, you know, it's kind of hard. It's going to be hard because every soil is different. So, um, and when you, are you saying soil conditioners like, um, like chemical conditioners or 
or like just organic compost? Or organic content. Yeah. You know, we hear a lot of, you know, landscapers utilizing that soil conditioner to go in. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, just pretty much using any kind of organic matter, right? So a lot of times people will say, like, I bought the, I went to the nursery, I bought the best organic matter you could buy, or I bet the most expensive. And, right, it doesn't have to be the most expensive, right? You just need organic matter, you know, preferably maybe well composted organic matter, or if it's a special job or spec, like they may spec out, like, hey, you must use leaf compost uh, organic matter. but um, uh, but yeah, just any kind of organic matter, okay. um, preferably it was composted. If and it's not composted, you may get some shrinkage. Okay. So really incorporation is going to be key in that too, right, Robert? Not yeah, just yeah. throwing it in the hole, but literally taking and mixing all these together to create your yeah. soil. Yeah. And then mixing at, uh, a right. So I guess one thing I did mention is mixing at a right soil moisture. So one thing you run into trouble with on like agricultural soil is if you till a wet soil, you, you did a worse job than if you tilled a, a dry soil, right? So you're not trying to get soil erosion, but um, so till a soil when it's, you know, when your machinery can till it, but don't till a wet, wet soil because then you're just destroying all the soil structure. You're making things worse and don't, don't overwork it, right? Because you do want some soil structure. So don't overwork a soil where you destroy all that soil structure. Uh, and now you just have a, you know, your own engineered soil of organic matter, sand, soil, clay particles that are kind of loose. You, know, you want some soil structure, you want the organic matter. So, I mean, it's kind of a hard, uh, I wish there was a way to say like, you know, till it gently for five to 10 minutes and then you're, you're good, but there's no, there's no easy recipe. It's kind of all by feel. Yeah. Um, and hey, Robert, Robert, there's a couple other questions came up about compaction. So uh, one is compaction is not usually a spec in our contracts. Do you have any recommendations to adding language for soil specs? Um, yeah, I mean, it would be, uh, I'm trying to think of how, is it for, if it was for buying soil, it'd be hard, right? Because when you buy soil in bulk, it's already been mixed and turned and chit and, uh, mixed and churned and so it's kind of this loose uh loose mix already so it's going to have a low uh a low bulk and hopefully it has a low bulk density um if it doesn't have a low bulk density when it's been in the back of a dump truck then that's a that's a red flag um but i guess it would be like if it was if you were a landscaper and you had a contractor who brought it in and spread it out you could say you know when you spread it out the bulk density you know should be less than 1.4 or whatever, right? Like that's a, you know, I don't know what a reasonable, you know, you would want it to be, you know, less than 1.4 or, or you know, somewhere not in the danger zone. And so I don't know if you just have that in the spec, how you work that out. Because the other problem would be the depth of it, right? Like the bulk density, uh, zero to six inches must be this, or zero to 12 inches must be this. Um, so that may be another aspect of it is not only worrying about what the bulk density number should be, but what should the depth of it, the testing be, right? So um, uh, so I'm trying to think how they would put it in a spec. So I'm gonna talk uh, about heavy metal and uh, mostly just bring across the key points that uh, that you would wanna you know, ask either the homeowner or, or the, the HOA or whoever it is you're dealing with. So we keep talking about the heavy metals and where they come from. So you had lead paint. Um, so a lot of times you're looking at painted houses, painted brick, painted barns, painted sheds in areas close to that. Uh, also lead in gasoline. So if you have soil near roadways or driveways uh, or old parking lots, you're gonna probably have find lead high in those areas. And then also arsenic pesticides. So you usually find high arsenic where there's uh, orchards. So if they if this uh, was once an orchard in the past, you might find high arsenic levels. Uh, and then also to keep in mind when these things were banned, right? So uh, lead was banned in 1978 and, and paint. So if it's a brand new house, um, probably a low likelihood of, of lead being in the soil. Um, if it's a brand new house, like, and there was never a road nearby it since 86 or so, probably a lower chance of lead being in the soil. And then same thing for arsenic. So if if it was an orchard, but it wasn't an orchard, you know, 
pre-88, probably a low chance for high arsenic levels to be in there. So you know, it kind of tells you uh, the key thing is like the location and the timing of, of these soils. So the, uh, the key thing is also the, like the exposure. So a lot of things that they're worried about in the interpretations are uh, kids playing in the soil. Um, so the, you know, kids will naturally play in the soil. Uh, they'll, they may actually accidentally eat it or they'll get on their hands and then they'll go eat a snack or something. So they worry about kids actually ingesting the soil. Um, and don't worry, she was supervised by a trained soil scientist while she was playing in the soil. So she's okay. Um, another thing would be leafy grains, right? So leafy grains are real close to the soil. So if the soil is high in lead and soil gets on the leafy greens and you don't wash off the dirt very well and then you eat the dirt, that's how you're gonna get uh, trouble from lead, uh, lead toxicity or also root crops, right? The crops are actually touching the soil and you don't scrape off the dirt very well from the, from the plant and then you eat, eat that root crop, you're gonna ingest a lot of, a lot of lead. So mostly it comes down from a, an ingestion standpoint. Um, so things to, to look out for when uh, you are sampling or somebody's concerned about it. You know, so we kind of mentioned before distance from the road, right? So it's going to be higher, closer to the road or the driveway where gasoline may have leaked or emissions have been a, a long time over, uh, have been there for a long time. The depth of the soil is also important. So lead isn't going to go very deep down, right? So, you know, a zero to six inch stamp sample is still uh, good for looking for lead in the soil. So don't go too deep down because you may start to dilute it out. So, you know, stay in that zero to six inch range. Um, and then also, you may ask them like, where are they going to garden, right? If, if they're only worried about, you know, lead in their garden and their garden's gonna be in their backyard, you may not sample everywhere around it, just sample where they're concerned about it. Uh, so just sample in that, that garden area. There was also different methods to, to test the soil. Um, so, and I'm just giving this uh, slide out there so you are aware that there are different, um, different ways to look for lead in the soil and not every way is equal. All uh, right, so there's malic one, which is kind of a screening way. It's the same like nutrient. You can use malic three to look for lead. You can use one normal nitric acid, which it looks at a little bit more lead. And then it's the a full nitric digestion, which is EPA 3050, which all the interpretations are based off of. So if you send sample to a lab and they give you like a malic one number, you may want to ask them, is this translated to what it might have been if it was a total digestion? Or is it just kind of like based off soil summary data? Or if it's the same thing for one normal nitric, like the method is very important in coming up with the interpretation of is this dangerous or not. So always be mindful when you send it out or you get the results back, like know how was it done. So when you look at the interpretations, you're comparing apples to apples and not apples to oranges. Because these other methods, you'll get a lower value and you may think you're safe if you compare it to a total value. Um, and that, that would be dangerous. Oh, there we go. I was wondering why my pictures didn't show up, but yeah, so these are just pictures of, of testing soil on an ICP. Um, and so I was trying to give you uh, just an idea of, uh, you know, metals and their range and guidance. And just keep in mind, like this is for, for New York. I was mostly just trying to show that, you know, there's a wide range of metals on the soil. It's going to happen um, because soils just naturally have a lot of things in them. They're not like pure mixes of, of any one particular thing. Um, and then also keep in mind that the guidance range is going to change state by state mostly, right? So you may find that one state has these guidance ranges, another state has another guidance range. And don't panic, you know, right? It's just, you know, each state just came up with these guidelines differently. Um, so you may use the ones that are more conservative if you're real conservative or, or relax or somewhere in the middle. It's kind of up to your, your risk assessment. Um, but I was also wanting to show that, um, so this is New York City. Uh, this is New York state background and then the New York City. So it's a pretty, you know, industrialized place that, you know, the arsenic can, can range from 4 to 26 in the city. Uh, lead can be 48 to 690, you know, but even the background in a rural places can be 3 to 72, right? Um, so it's just, there could be a wide range naturally of lead or arsenic in the soil. So don't, don't always assume it was put there by man. It could have been just natural. It could be an old lead mine. It could be put there naturally as well. And then uh, this is an example of specifically for lead, because that's usually the main 
the main concern when people call in. And I wanted to kind of also show that um, even within lead, there's different ideas of action levels, right? So on the one on the left is from Connecticut. You know, if, it, if the total lead is less than 100 parts per million, no concern. Uh, if it's 100 to 300, it's elevated, we'll follow best management practices, which I kind of talk about on the next slide. If it's 300 to 400, then don't grow leafy greens, don't grow vegetable root crops, and don't let children play in the soil. And if it's 400, then uh, you know it's above the EPA level of concern, so don't, don't garden in that soil at all. And one on the right is from Wisconsin, so they, they have a little bit more conservative uh, approach to it. If it's less than 52, it's no concern. If it's 52 to 200, it's safe uh, for gardening, but use it under limited contact. And then I don't know why they went from 200 to, to 1200 as opposed to 400, but they, they went pretty high. They must have a lot of lead somewhere in Wisconsin. So, uh, but they say seek professional advice is uh, if you're above 200 in Wisconsin. So just giving you an idea that you're, you're going to see a lot of different ranges out there. Uh, don't panic if you see different ranges. Just kind of look at all the different ones. Keep in mind the 400 is pretty much the EPA level of concern. So if you see anything above 400, that's a huge red flag. If it's above 100, get get worried. Uh, so some best management practices adjust the pH. Right, you lead is less uh, soluble in the soil if it's if the pH is between six and a half to seven. Add phosphorus to the soil. So normally I don't. I recommend always adding phosphorus to the soil, um, especially if it's high in phosphorus already. But if you have high lead levels, adding more phosphorus will help form lead phosphate, which is less soluble. And so it's less prone for uptake. So by all means, now add, add phosphorus to the soil. Add organic matter. So I think, uh, I think this is a Penn State recommendation where two inches for every six inches of soil. So, you know, add down, uh, add two inches of soil. And then I guess do the scoop and, scoop and dump method. Right, they mix it in with the top six inches, and th this is mostly for uh, one. You get a dilution effect, right? You're diluting out that soil with organic matter, and two, that organic matter will kind of hold on to any any loose lead that may be out there. And again, avoid root crops, leafy greens. Maybe just convert it to a turf, you know, shrub bed, lawn, you know, flower bed, something where you're not always in it, and it's just a um, you're not going to be breathing that soil by tilling it up or ingesting that soil by putting your hands in it or eating anything off that soil. Do you, are there any questions on the, the heavy metal front? Great, Robert. So there is one that popped up. Have you seen any native worm season grasses that help to uptake these heavy metals? Um, so I don't know if there are native worm seasons. So usually like if you Google uh, hyper accumulators is the name for the different plants. Sometimes people use sunflowers for uh, uh, to hyper accumulate metals from the ground. And sometimes it, you know, depending on the level of contamination, it could take a lot of uh, you know, growing these plants for a few years to get all that, that biomass to soak it up. And then you have to worry about once you cut the, you know, the, that plant matter, where do you take it? Because now it's going to be high in, in, uh, in heavy metals. So um, I don't know if there are any native warm season grasses that would take up a lot of heavy metals, but I can... I've got one more, Robert. If you have severe compaction and water was sitting on the grass, could adding organic matter and aeration help get rid of moss? And I know Mark kind of chimed in on this as well, but what are your thoughts, Dr. Florent? Yeah, so like, I mean, moss, you know, it can be an indicator of the pH being low. Usually moss um, is a sign of like heavy compacted soils, right? Because it doesn't have to penetrate the soil. It just, it can grow on top of a real, um, heavy soil. It's also a real wet area. So um, aerating and putting organic matter may not solve it if, you know, the landscape deems that that's just going to be a wet soil, if it's you know, acidic. So you can fix the acidity part. Um, if you can get that grass to take and just physically outcompete the moss, then um, uh, then that would be one way to do it. But yeah, you'd want to, I guess you want to make sure that the landscape isn't the main thing driving moss being there versus grass, right? Is it, is it shaded? Yeah. Is it just so heavy shaded that there will be no grass to grow there? So moss just naturally takes over. Um, so yeah, you can get rid of the moss, aerate, put organic matter there and try to get grass to physically be established to outcompete it. But if it's in a, if it's really wet, really shaded, and you still have sub drainage, problems, the, the moss may, may come back. Great. 
And how about, can you explain how you would want someone to take a heavy metal sample? Yeah. I mean, essentially just like you would do for like a, a soil fertility test, right? So, and you'd want to do, try to get a good average of the area. So there's going to be a lot more variability with heavy metals in an urban soil than like the nutrients, right? Because, you know, the, the, uh, what some of the studies found was the distance from the painted house is a huge part of the concentration. If you're, you take the sample right up close to the house, you're going to get really high results. The farther away you go from the house, you'll get lower and lower until eventually, you know, you're like 20 feet away and there's just very little amount there or same thing for the road. So it would mostly be, you know, take it where uh, the people are concerned about, right? So if you're going to put the garden right next to that formerly painted place or the kids love playing in a dirt pit um, next to the road or next to the painted place, it's mostly going to be, I guess, try to sample where they are concerned about, um, that they would actively be messing with the soil or a possible chance of ingesting the soil or getting on your hands and you actually put it in your mouth. Um, so that would right. be wh where to sample. And then, uh, yeah, just take multiple samples from that area so you don't happen to hit a hot spot or a low spot, like you get an average, right? So maybe, you know, 10 subsamples. That way, no one sample will skew your results by 10%. Um, mix them up together really well, and then uh, you can send them send them to the lab. Uh, but yeah, that would be a, a good way to kind of think about having how to sample for for heavy metal. Well, Robert, thank you for joining us today, and all the other presenters. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys. Great talks. Absolutely. Lots of good comments, Andrea. Of course, uh, Robert Carroll. I think she's already left. It. I want to thank Lee Rumble again and you know his crew up there and keeping everybody straight on registration and Lindsey Fox who keeps everybody straight on that. And same to you, Tom. Thanks, Lee.